You ready, Christina? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Well, good morning. Okay, so uh, we're ready to begin the second part of the Board of Governors meeting. Everybody tuned in? Yes, I can begin with the roll call. Okay, um, yeah, please call the roll. Hildegard B. Aguinaldo. Amy Costa. Here. Darius Anderson. Here. Tom Epstein. Here. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Colm Fitzgerald. Here. Jolina Grande. Here. Pamela Haynes. Here. Kevin Hawk. Eleni Onalakis. Jennifer Perry. Hi. Ha, just kidding here. <laughs> Bill Rawlings. Here. Alma Salazar. Valerie Shaw. Here. Valerie Shaw. Yulia Tarasova. William. I feel like I'm back in school, present. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna start with an announcement. Um, last night, uh, I received an email from uh, board member Kim Perigo uh, informing us that she is resigning from the Board of Governors uh, for personal reasons immediately. So uh, she won't be with us today, we appreciate all of the conscientious work that she put in as a member of the Board of Governors and, um, and her perspective. And uh, so with that, we'll move on. And we have uh, to start the meeting, a special guest uh, from the, the Office of the Governor, uh, Lande Ajose, who is the Senior Policy Advisor to Governor Newsom. In addition to managing the higher ed portfolio, she also, uh, is integral to the uh, Economic Recovery Task Force, the uh, Jobs of the Future Task Force. And uh, when I understand, she's the advanced person that sets up those beautiful fire smoke shots uh, when he's out visiting um, fire stations. So uh, with that, um, we will turn it over to Dr. Jose. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, You're on mute. There, can you hear me now? Yes. There we go, sorry. I was just saying thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm embracing all of my roles, but none none more than advanced person. You know, if I can <laughs> set up those smoke shots, I've, I've, got, I've got something going. Um, good morning, everyone. I really am delighted to be with you this morning. Uh, I know that uh, I bring the governor's um, uh, greetings. He is uh, busy doing all of the things that you see him doing uh, every day, uh, meeting with uh, people up and down the state, trying to make sure the state stays reopened, uh, fighting fires, 
thinking about the economic recovery. Um, this has been the most unusual of years for the state of California and for our nation. And um, I feel very, very fortunate to be in an opportunity to, to be of service with, with Governor Newsom in this moment. Um, I wanted to just talk with you a little bit about what it's like uh, these days to be in the governor's office and how we are thinking about our work going forward as we enter into, into the new year. Uh, there's no doubt that the, the crises of the pandemic and uh, the attendant economic recession and the, uh, the racial reckoning that we find ourselves, our country, our state, our nation, in, and not to mention the, the things that are uniquely Californian or at least uniquely uh, unique to the West Coast, which include uh, fires and uh, other kinds of natural disasters, um, the, the presence of climate change in a way that is uh, so uh, so relevant to so many of us these days. A time I think in the state of California where we faced so many challenges uh, all at one time, and of course uh, with limited resources. So this has uh, been it's been a unique moment um, since since March 10th. Our staff, like many of you, have been working from home and trying to uh, govern the state of California from our bedrooms and dining rooms and living rooms. And, uh, and also trying to really make sure that we are supporting uh, the governor and the administration and everything that, that we need to do now. Um, and the governor has really done a few things that have really, um, I think, helped to guide us uh, through this, this period of time. One is really thinking about um, not only do we need to manage the pandemic, and as you all know, we are managing that on a, on a day to day basis, um, but we also need to be thinking about um, that exists in California between lives and livelihoods. And uh, for us, that means really thinking very carefully about um, what we need to do to keep Californians um, as safe as we possibly can during the pandemic, as we, and, and to keep our workers, especially those who are essential workers and on the front lines as safe as we can. And to also at the same time, think about how do we make sure that Californians can earn a living, that they have secure housing, um, that they are able to live the lives that they need to live. And so um, Governor Newsom in late April convened a task force called the Jobs and Recovery Task Force to really think about what the pathway through some of this was, at least on the economic side and the relationship to all of that um, for, for the state. And that task force has been busy doing three things. One is uh, they've been essential to us in thinking about um, developing guidance by sector so that we could really have a, a reopening that was, was meaningful and that was really tied to what we understand very demands of each of the economic sectors that exist in the state. Um, you know, we um, went through one reopening and uh, we're doing it a little bit differently this time because we don't want to see us in the place where we were when we were at a peak in July. And so we, but we are trying to figure out how do we make sure that Californians are able, able to work, but are able to do so mitigating as much risk as possible. Um, not everyone, only 22% of Californians actually uh, work from home via uh, Zoom or some, some kind of um, online technology. So we still have a number of Californians who either are not working or who are out, uh, have to leave their homes in order to work. And so we really are trying to think about what does it mean to provide for safety for those individuals who have to be out and about. The second piece of what we are, the task force has been focused on is jobs and um, employment. Um, what is critical right now is that we get many more Californians back to work. Uh, we have some uh, economies that have uh, really uh, been incredibly, you know, hurt and decimated. Uh, you know, tourism and travel and many of those economies are really struggling. And so that's a lot of people who really just are out of work. And we are trying to think about what does it mean to re-employ those people? Where do we have uh, economic sectors that uh, are stand to grow during this period of time? And how can we make some matches between those employment sectors and the individuals who need to find jobs? And then I think the third piece that we've been thinking about on the task force that I think is interesting and doesn't really occur to people on a natural basis is mean to think about the, the unintended, positive unintended consequences of this, um, of this recession and of, of the pandemic. Uh, one thing that we have learned is that there's a lot more that we can all do 
from the confines of our home. Um, so how do we think about marshalling technology for everyone? That has led the governor to a deep focus on the digital divide, particularly as it's essential for so many students these days to be able to um, learn from home and the distance learning is a significant challenge that we face across the nation. We've done everything from working with internet service providers to ensure that they are offering uh, fair plans to Californians in ways that are consumer friendly, to um, trying to get as many Chromebooks for, for kids and ensuring that we have hotspots for college students. We've been working across all of those fronts to really try and make sure that Californians have the means and the technology and the tools that they need to make their way through this pandemic. So, I, so the task force um, has been part of our immediate response to, to what we see. Um, in addition to that, because that's only half my job, and I have other duties as assigned, as, as, as uh, the chair mentioned, um, the other half of my job is really thinking about higher education. And I feel so fortunate to, um, to be able to do that with so many California um, leaders and, and faculty and uh, stakeholders across the state. Um, and one of the things we thought about back in I think it was April. We thought, you know, even though this is a really difficult moment for higher education, and I must say, I could not have been prouder of the higher education segments and the way that people pivoted on a dime to ensure that students did not go without their education. It was really unprecedented, I am sure, in the history of this nation to watch you know, all of education find a new delivery model in the space of weeks so that students could continue their education. But we also recognize that at some point we'd be on the other side of all of this. We'd be on the other side of this racial reckoning. We'd be on the other side of um, the economic crisis and on the other side of the pandemic. And what do we want higher education to look like in that moment? That was the question that we were asking ourselves. And so to answer that question, um, with the blessings of the, the Council on Post-Secondary Education, we convened a task force which is called the Recovery with Equity Task Force. Because what I am sure of is this, that the state of California and the state of our higher education systems in December of 2019, while improving, did not guarantee the kind of equity that we really want to see for Californians. And it's not good enough to think that once this is all over, we're going to go back to that place because we actually have an opportunity to craft a new future. And we actually have an opportunity to be in a different place. Uh, one thing that we saw through the pandemic is that suddenly we have telework and telehealth and distance learning. And I think that there is a moment, there is a way to harness this moment and think about what are the opportunities to really advance equity for students in this moment that maybe would not have been possible for us 10 months ago or 12 months ago. Uh, and so that's really what that task force is doing. The task force um, is comprised of three main groups. One is a set of um, innovators and um, e equity experts from across the nation. We really called together some national leaders to help us understand what else is help happening around the country when it comes to equity and innovation and opportunity and how can California learn from that. We've also put together kind of a set of folks, which includes um, Daisy, and to really think about how do we include and engage our higher education systems and segments in that work. And then finally, we pulled together some folks who are more uh, stakeholders in the process, who represent uh, student groups or student advocates or um, policy advocates to really help us think about and what about those who find themselves sometimes knocking at the door? How do we make sure their voices are also heard? And so we are bringing these folks together. We're meeting approximately once a month. We've divided ourselves into four working groups or we have four working groups in addition to the task force. And those working groups are focused on things like K-12 alignment, uh, persistence and completion. Uh, how do we think about intersegmental coordination? And how do we think in, in, especially about adult students? because we know that the vast majority of students in our higher education system these days are not necessarily 18 and coming from mom and dad's house and going to college. They are adults, they're 24 and older. Many of them have children of their own. And we need to ensure that we are designing, not allowing, but designing a higher education system that serves them. And so we are really using that task force to, to think through what the future of California higher education can be, how can we get there? How do we have the alignment and the engagement and the support 
of all of the higher education segments in doing that? And, um, and, and what does that then look like, uh, hopefully at a moment that we have resources? Um, I'll just speak to resources for a moment because it um, is always the elephant in the room. And as you all know, this has been a really difficult budget year for California. We found ourselves uh, facing a deficit of $54.3 billion. Um, while next year does not look to be anywhere near that dramatic, we still are gonna be in the probably upwards of $10 billion uh, in terms of a state deficit. And we expect to have potentially even a larger deficit a few years out. Um, and so we're really trying to think through um, how do we continue to do more with less? Um, we have made uh, numerous appeals to the federal government in that regard. Um, I will say that the economic task force that the governor created on, on jobs in the economy was instrumental in helping us make many of those appeals. And we really are in addition, you know, trying to figure out how do we, how do we um, make sure that the resources that we spend really align with our values. But we don't anticipate that we're gonna have any more money. So we really have to figure out what is important to us and make sure that we align our spending as it exists now with our priorities as they exist, because that is, those are the resources that we are likely to have in the near term. Um, so that is basically the state of play, if you will. Um, I am, wanna just close by, by extending a thank you to all of you for your uh, steadfast stewardship of, of this system. As you know, this is the largest system. It is the most diverse system. It is the people's system. And without you, there are so many students who would not have access to a higher education or access to a credential or access to workforce training. And so the work that you do is essential. I want to say thank you to Chancellor Oakley because he really was very clear eyed from the moment the pandemic hit about the kinds of uh, resources that he would need, not necessarily money from the government, but what did he need in terms of authority? What did he need in terms of people to come together? And what did he need in terms of charting a path forward? And that kind of leadership is uh, unique for Cal uh, not for California, but unique for I think higher education. And we are just so fortunate to have him and uh, I'm especially thankful to all of the staff and administration and college and presidents who found themselves in just what seemed like untenable conditions uh, this past year, who really found a way to make it work for students and for faculty. Um, but mostly, I feel like I need to say thank you to the students, because this is not an easy place to be. It is not easy to try to figure out how to get your education in this moment. It's not easy to figure out how to take care of your families in this moment. It's not easy to figure out where to study or if you have internet access in this moment. And this is a moment where we cannot give up on the promise of education. Because what we know is it is essential, not just to our present, but it is essential to our future. And we know that students are essential to our future. So I just wanna say thank you for all, to all of you and for all of you for sticking it out. Um, and to say that know that, that Governor Newsom has your back, um, as do I always. Um, and just thank you again for having me this morning. You're on mute, Tom. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Londe. Very, it's very well said. And um, that we know the board and, and the staff greatly appreciate all the support we've gotten from the governor's office. Uh, for the entire system, also for Calbright. And uh, we really appreciate all, all that you personally do uh, in such good spirit. And, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Okay. Um, I, before we get started, I want to note that we, uh, a couple more members uh, should be noted on the roll call, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis and Alma Salazar have both uh, joined the meeting. And um, so with that, I believe uh, our next item is to go to the uh, Napa Valley College presentation. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, Dr. Kraft, we all uh, wish we were there with that background behind you. Um, we, uh, we really were looking forward to coming. Uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get a chance to get out there sometime soon. And, um, and we look forward to your presentation today. Morning, thank you. Yeah, there's worse places to work um, than, than what you've seen behind me a little bit. 
Um, I, I think we have about um, between 25 and 30 minutes or so, and I'll, I'll kind of walk us through. So thanks, um, Eloy, Chancellor Oakley, and, and board for inviting me. It's interesting to see you all here and, um, in, you know, kind of in your native habitat. So um, let's just get rolling a little bit. Um, I want to welcome um, you, and you were supposed to be here, as you said, and, and we look forward to hosting you in the future. So um, I don't know when that will be, um, but um, we will be giving you, when you show up, this uh, estate wine that we made. It's here and ready for you. Um, so I would like to invite individual members, uh, you know, you're, you're all scattered all over, but you could certainly contact my office. Um, would love to tour you individually, um, show you around a little bit. So um, please, um, you know, think about that uh, as a possibility. Um, let me introduce you to my cabinet. Um, so I'm not sure, I don't think that I can advance these slides. So um, let me see if we are, you should be on, on the cabinet slide. Let's, let's get to that one a little bit. And we're past this one. We're just rolling a little bit. There's the cabinet. Um, I have a very diverse cabinet uh, and, and probably uh, I'm really blessed in that we have, um, they wouldn't like me saying this, but you know, hundreds of years collectively of, um, of strength and background and um, our, our cabinet has evolved o over the years. What I have found is important. I'll probably try to share a few things from my perspective from the field. Um, cabinets uh, used to stay forever, um, and they don't anymore. Um, so having a having a cabinet at five years is considered a real win for a community college. It hurts the system, but people people move around as opportunity. So there's there's expertise. Um, we have a, a very strong um, staff, and I'm, I'm excited to introduce you. You can see Charles Oberon, Oscar DeHaro, um, Bob Parker. We just hired our new um, Sarah Parker, Dr. Sarah Parker. Um, stole her from Chabot, so very happy about, about that. Um, and our board of trustees, if you can, um, it may be down on the next, the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, Rosada Segura, no it's not, I'm sorry. Rosa Segura, our president, she's finishing her term and running for city council. Um, and Jim, Michael Baldini, Jennifer Baker, Jeff Dodd, Elizabeth Goff, Kyle Iverson, and Rafael Rios. We'll have a new board member joining us um, in November along with a new student um, as well. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, COVID threw us for a little bit of a uh, a mix on our on our student government, so we had to go out, and we're going back out for uh, um, elections in the um, in the next month or so. Now we are on slide four, and I'll I'll just work that way. A little bit of history here, not not to bore you too much, but we're about mm, seventy five plus years old. We started um, in 1941, um, and we're deeply intertwined. What's different about a small more rural uh, college like ours is there is absolutely no difference uh, in anybody's mind but uh, of the college and the community it's it's deeply embedded so they don't say napa valley college they just say the college um, or the napa valley college for some people have been here for years we have a one-to-one -one ratio which means every single business winery tourism anything in the valley has at least one graduate or attendee. And um, it's remarkable. So we have a high name recognition and um, we have done uh, over the years iterative um, um, steps. So we bought some land in, um, in the 60s, which was um, a, a separate piece from the state hospital. Um, I, the, the quote on this land back in the 60s, you guys will like this, it was, this was useless land on the outskirts of the town of Napa, which has no future or history. Um, and so they donated 168 acres. We have found that over the years, um, the valley has moved south. So Napa Valley College is, finds itself now not in the outskirts, but in the center of Napa, five minutes from downtown. Um, and we have a beautiful campus. Um, you know, well, I'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, the, as the city has grown south, 
Napa Valley College has emerged as a central piece. So we are really considered part of um, the downtown of the city. Um, why don't you go to the campuses, which is our four sites. Um, our main campus, 180 acres next to the river, lots of open space, trees. We have a pond in, in the middle, which back in the day we used to uh, have a fly fishing class. Um, we have a five acre vineyard on our main campus here, um, a winery, tasting rooms, a performing arts center, a life sciences, and um, uh, it, it's, it's a long um, vertical kind of campus, which is um, reminds people a bit of a university style. Um, it, it, and so it is a, a very comfortable, very safe campus. And we have a lot of students coming from surrounding areas who just enjoy the ambience of it. Um, in addition, we have an upper valley campus, which is in the northern part of, of the valley in St. Helena. Um, it, it, we feature up there professional culinary, hospitality, wine, travel, tourism, and a variety of, of classes, um, particularly around ESL. We have, as you know, you can misunderstand Napa and think wealth and wineries and owners, but it's a very bifurcated kind of uh, county. So the solid backbone of this valley are, are working um, folks who work in the work in the fields, who work in the wineries, who help in the hospitality piece. And um, um, the ESL has been a, a singularly really important piece. We have um, operated classes, you know, in the fields, if you will, and also um, in different sites throughout throughout Napa. Um, American Canyon is the southernmost city, and we have a center on the American Canyon High School, along with offices and classrooms um, that were built when that high school was built. Um, we're co-branded with them, so when you pass the signage out there, it says American Canyon High School, Napa Valley College, and our goal just before COVID hit was to see if we could create a, a cohort of classes where people could attend just there and pick up their AA. We're, we're still growing, but um, you know, life, life happens. And then a little bit north of downtown Napa, up in the foothills, we have a, our Mount Veter property, which is 168 acres of, um, you know, kind of wonderful, uh, historic, environmental sensitive, but we're using it really for um, leadership, environmental studies, physical science, viticulture, and we're excited. We, it got um, bruised and burned in the, in the 2017 fires. So it's all clean now and kind of ready to go. Um, excited about those. What this does, these four sites, it really presents a lot of opportunities for our students, no matter where you are or what you'd like to do. Let me, let me tie in a little bit of our strategic goals, um, which is the next um, slide, please. Um, I, I, I do want to thank um, Holly Dawson, our world-class public information officer for um, helping to shape this um, presentation and, and helping me see that, uh, you know, we are in such alignment I think, you know, with the vision for success and guided pathways and have been. Um, local educational partners is a huge piece of every community college and, and you all know that. We have counselors and in, enrollment specialists on every campus in the county. Um, now it's, that's more virtual, but um, as we recover, um, we have that special office space there. Um, our goal really is to do two things. I, I wanna make sure that that we address both transfer um, degree seeking and career and technical students. Cause there are three, um, and, and, you know, kind of individual pathways there. There are more of course, but the, the Valley is unique in that we are, we are rich in jobs within the Valley, uh, well-paying jobs in the Valley. Um, however, you know, as you know, um, part of the hospitality crunch and travel and tourism has really hit hard. So um, our, our students are struggling right now. So it's, it's more than ever. We're trying to focus on engaging these students and assisting in their progress as, as we move forward. 
another goal that I had coming into this job in 2012, which was a, again, just a, a tough time was physical stability. Um, we're an emerging um, community supported district, only one of eight or so. I'll call that a baby um, community support, which is we're basically above break even where some colleges have been a community support for a long time. Um, ours has just passed us over that, um, that threshold of community support. So we have to be extremely cautious on our spend. Um, it, it does provide some advantages, I think, that we can kind of look and, and feel somewhat secure, but um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about a year from now and seeing what the economy might do. I, I really appreciated um, Dr. Rose, Jose, ah, Jose um, her comments in terms of um, next year, it's the future years that we're, we're concerned with a bit. And um, we're adding a six goal. Thank you. I, I think as you know, as we start to uh, embrace the racial reckoning as well, um, we felt it really important to promote equity mindedness and and um, get that into our our um, goals. We had already started this process, so um, that should be going to our board in the next month or so. Um, the next slide, please. Um, Day one, hour one of my job in 2012, I came into my office, which has a whiteboard, and I wrote, it's all about the students. And it's, I can look at it over there, it's still on my whiteboard. It, it, everything that I have learned and uh, my mentors and, and leadership has been, if you focus that, that's the key question. If any decision we walk away from in cabinet or the board is not all about students, then I wanna know why. And I, I want to know why are we making that decision? Um, we are unique, I, I think, as a swath in the United States and certainly in California and certainly Napa Valley College in being massively student oriented. There was a time, and some of you might remember this, when um, referring to students as customers was considered bad taste. Um, they didn't like the mixture. People didn't like this mixture of business language. And now we've moved to the opposite of that, which is we're customer centric. It, it is all about the students. So what do we do? Um, I'm a product of the California Community College system, first gen, economically disadvantaged. Um, I, I, you know, I, I share that uh, in, in my speeches or conversations with people, uh, it's important to know the ground you're walking on. And um, it, it, uh, it is here in Napa, I think important to understand that we have those students who are driven to succeed and they come with a whole bag of, of possibilities. And then there's kind of lost and found students. Um, there are um, many conversations and stories about students. We all have them from all of the colleges of great success stories. And, and we tend to focus, I think, on, on metrics without really ratcheting in on particular students. So it, it is important, and what I've been talking about here at the college for years, is to identify a particular student. We're not talking to the aggregate, ever. We're talking to a specific student. And as, and as soon as you start teaching and talking to people in the aggregate, you lose, you lose them. It, it's, it's really about that. So um, uh, we've really em, em, embraced um, this customer-centric piece. And I'll talk a little more about that as we go. Um, the next slide, please. Guided Pathways. Um, familiar territory, again, I started in the system teaching high school back in the early 80s. And Guided Pathways in California, especially in San Diego, was part of the lexicon. Um, it really were, was Guided Pathways. Some of you remember the college prep and and um, applied arts kind of in the, in, in the high school. And then we moved that. But when I entered community college, we really were seriously embraced by counselors who created an educational plan for us, and we walked that through. Now, over the years, as we moved to access, um, we, we broadened that, and then coming back to Guided Pathways, I think is working you know, wonderfully. Um, the framework for students, I think, um, in enrollment decisions is preparing them for success in ways I think that 
at least here is really is really paying off. Um, the big difference in, in in I think how a community college can best address is there used to be silos and there still are between academic affairs and student support. However, with AB 705, with Guided Pathways Vision for Success and COVID, they have all but disappeared. I cannot run, lead, or inspire a college by talking to an academic silo or a student support silo. So our cross-functional teams, um, which started with you know, Guided Pathways and Leading from the Middle, are all over the college. Um, if a college insists on silos, then they're doing it to the detriment of their student populations. And that, that's, we are working very um, diligently, I think, on, on creating these um, pathways as, as you go. I don't um, encourage anybody to say, you know, my shop, which is language that we use, meaning, you know, my area or your area. Um, let's talk about students first. What is this decision? How does it integrate across the, across the college? Um, vision for success is the next slide. I'm drinking my coffee. This is my fifth cup. So um, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it at least this morning. Um, <clears throat> Guided Pathways provided the, the framework um, for the vision for success, which I, I have to comment, it, it really is working. When, when this was rolled out, um, you know, the, the chancellor was very excited about <clears throat> changing the paradigm, changing the structure. Can we not do things innovatively within the system? Can we not, you know, what do we, what do, we do to make this um, change a little bit? And I'm proud of the work that our, our faculty and staff have done. And um, um, we've achieved uh, many of these goals. I, I think there are some of them up here, you know, approved certificates are up. I think certificates are, uh, historically undervalued. I, I know for a fact that, you know, my, I have a business background as well. And LinkedIn, for example, um, their algorithm search is not for degrees, their algorithm search is on certs. Um, so when people are applying for jobs, it first searches for certifications and then it will step down. That is not to say that, a, a, you know, a four year degree or degree or an associate's or whatever is not critically important. What, what, it, what I am saying is that certificates are picking up a string. So there's, there's fewer um, miles of distance between a student, in my mind at least, with a group of certificates in, a, in an area as opposed to a student with a degree. There, that gap is closing. And um, in Napa Valley, a, a, a strong certification in our viticulture area or wine marketing or in health sciences is, is, is uh, seems to be working very well. Um, our associate degree for transfer up, you know, up a bit. Um, we're a, a little under, um, we were really tracking. I have no idea what, you know, what's gonna happen on COVID. This will be a really interesting study to look back on to say, you know, what's happening here. I'm hoping that our high school students now who are getting, uh, what I'll just say is interesting education um, are going to enter. So I think we're going to have some remediation to do once we, once we hit the street again. And, and I'm, I'm very um, interested in that. Um, student support, the next one, please. Um, COVID-19 has changed the way we live. And I agree. Uh, it, it has been horrible. However, if I, and I'm an opportunity-driven kind of entrepreneurial president, um, it has provided opportunities to do some of the things that we wanted to do, which is um, technology, you know, more online, so, you know, be more available to students 724. Those things have, have really come up across. Napa Valley has been hit really hard, y'all. Um, you know, we're really tourism travel. So um, I'm happy to say our wineries, sales rooms, have never had such high sales ever. The, the, everybody's ordering a case of wine so they can watch Netflix. However, our, our, our tax people coming into the Valley, those things are not doing so well. And, and we're just starting to recover. 
um, knock on wood here a little bit. Um, first and foremost, we're communicating care with our student support. Um, we called every single student when COVID hit. Um, I, we mobilized the entire college. Every single student we have received a phone call from us. Um, or, and then we followed up with texts. Um, our food pantry um, was um, expanded. Thank you, by the way, the Board of Governors for your support. You, you recently um, donated the, a food pantry um, check. It was um, immediately uh, thankful and pre-spent before I could even, you know, click. Um, so we are we are providing a lot of food for the communities. CARES Act as well, and then we put a lot of technological measures in. Full measure, DocuSign, which took a while. Um, our bureaucracy as an institution has has really gone almost to, to zero. Cranium Cafe, which is a, a real time um, counseling um, um, technical entity. Um, those, are, those are paying off. So I would say that our students are getting solid counseling, good information as we go. Community support. I'm trying to stay on time, y'all. I have no idea, but um, I'm, I'm working my way through. Um, community support. Uh, when I came in, enhancing collaboration between NBC, um, we've had professional baseball teams here, um, one of the first. We have a, a robust district auxiliary services um, which I think every community college should have and, and really focus on how that can help support students in terms of the non-traditional kinds of pieces that, that you do. We hosted a drive through pantry, COVID testing site. We hosted a farmer's market because the, the, the towns were closed up, but we could do that. Um, we played around with having an outdoor movie theater, but um, we just simply couldn't make that work. Um, Call to action, which is the next one, please. Um, uh, when all of this racial reckoning kind of happened, um, the, thank you, Eloy, for your call to action. I, I, was, I thought it was a, a great start, great leadership. Right away, we clicked in here as well. And um, I organized um, community dialogues for our faculty and staff, and right away. And um, we're committed to this diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've already transformed some policies. I've got those on the front burner. We're working them through the board. We're trying to take a look at any policy procedure that would bar equity, that would stand in the way. And um, you know, we took this challenge to engage in, in a good system. Um, we're participants in the California um, College Equity Leadership Alliance, um, which is um, already underway. Um, we have a Caring Campus Initiative, which is in, in the system, as you know, we're one of 18. Fabulous, y'all. It's really about all about the students. It, it is just teaching people to be um, not that salesperson in a, in a, um, a store who just points, you know, to be really focused in and around students. It's very interesting in this, in this world that we can um, make student, a simple greeting or hello can make a student um, successful, completely successful. Um, and we're incorporating everything we do. Um, we're out for a senior director, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We re reorganize, this is an important job. It needs to report to the president, to me. It needs to have that clout of that. And um, we're excited about that. A, a few highlights, a couple of things of, uh, I'd like to share with you. Um, it, what makes us so special? Uh, our students, obviously, faculty and staff. Best in the business. We have a lot of faculty who have been here quite a while and um, they don't want to leave. And um, I'm glad. Um, you know, the system will be turning over, I think, here in this year and next year. A lot of faculty, as you have heard, are not in it to teach online. They, it's just, it wasn't their vision. And we've been really lucky to hold on to faculty. We've created a faculty driven institute for learning um, through our academic Senate, which has certified every faculty member in distance education pedagogy. And specifically with, a, you know, a bias focused pedagogy, which every, every faculty member has gone through over the summer as well. Um, a state wines, 
what can I say? High marks, um, 94, they're in, they're in several stores. The Vendors Association, I just found out about this last week, um, we've been holding it, is um, partnering with us uh, on a mentor and internship opportunity. Um, they're creating with the United Negro College Fund to increase diversity, inclusivity in all aspects of the wine industry. In, in other words, there are not enough um, people of color in leadership positions in the Valley, not surprisingly. And um, we're very excited to be um, Sonoma State, UC Davis and ourselves. Um, we also have a medical scholars pathway program for Kaiser per Permanente, Permanente, one of the few in the nation that is community college oriented, which helps students identify the pathway to be physicians. Um, our respiratory therapy, um, just received a distinguished piece. We have an HI, HSI, this is the next slide, please. A grant, we just received our, our five-year grant. Um, and this is Caminos al Exito project, which is Pathways to Success. We're very excited about it. 45% of our student population, a little bit more, is Hispanic um, or Latinx. And we will um, probably exceed 50, 50 to 55% within the next two years or so. Um, and it, it, it is a wonderful gift to be able to offer students who, who can see a path future for them. And finally, um, student housing. Um, this was one of my dreams early on. What you're looking at is the front part of the campus. That's kind of our entry into the campus. That doesn't exist. This is just simply a drawing. Um, the goal really is to is to leverage on land. What's the highest and best use? Or this is this really about students or not? And the answer is yes. There's 600 beds here in a combination of traditional dorm, family apartments for single moms, um, students who are veterans. And we have, and we've organized this whole thing to really be a 724 residential campus. And Orange is, is doing this, Santa Rosa is doing this. I think as, as Board of Governors, you're gonna see a wave. COVID has thrown a little wrench into this, but I think you're gonna still see a wave of, of residential units within the community college world. I'd be very surprised if more than half don't have um, student housing within the next um, decade. So we're on track to have people move in in 2023. And that is the, the finished part of this presentation. These are, we are in VC. Um, we have found with all of our um, kind of communications, as you have, um, social media is the way to, to really get to students. Texting, you know, very personal. So thank you much. It's, it's an honor to be here. And uh, my invitation stands, of course. I would love for you to if you come out. And, and I don't have any idea if we have time for questions, but we certainly can do that if you'd like. Thank you very much, Dr. Fair. That was an excellent presentation. Um, we do have a little time for questions. I do want to reiterate to the board, we have a very long agenda again today. We have lots of public comment already filed, and I would strongly encourage everyone to be as concise as possible. But uh, I know there's going to be some questions for Dr. Kraft, so fire away. Hi, th this is Felicia. Um, uh, thank you for so much for the presentation. I'm sorry I was a bit late for it. Um, uh, this morning was dealing with sick children. Um, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to hear about uh, the great work that you're doing. Um, and um, you know that you noted that you're now an HSI. Um, I was wondering if you were also uh, working in your outreach to students and to families in the community with the farm worker community, as, as you as you probably have seen, and I'm sure you know better than most, the, the farm worker community has really been hit hard by COVID, but also now with the fires. Um, I'm interested to know how you do outreach to the, the community uh, as just a good uh, community leader. Um, and also if, if some of the work you're gonna be doing as an HSI might be um, you know, directed towards migrant children um, or even farm workers themselves uh, who are interested in, you know moving up the economic ladder and getting um, an education if, if they can do it, given all the other things that they're managing. 
Thanks. Yeah, I think in your question, you, you really outlined what we believe. Um, farm workers are the backbone of Napa Valley. Everybody recognizes that, especially the owners. The, the one thing that differentiates the valley from many of what I'll call just you know table grapes is that e each vine, with very few exceptions, is tended personally by somebody. Um, you know, we don't use machines up here, even though we could, and I think someday that's possible. But the focus has really been about taking care of farm workers, our food pantry. As I said, the, the Napa Valley College is a hub. Um, we see ourselves as a hub. So we're going to field, typically we would field conversations or telephone calls or connections and then connect those with the individual churches or civic organizations or whatever it might be to assist. So the, there are very strong organizations, Puertas Abuertas, and, and there are some other ones here in the, in the valley that we work hand in glove um, to, uh, to assist. So uh, I think my walk away on this is that it's top of mind for us. Um, we're very aware the, of the contribution of farm workers, farm worker families especially, and um, uh, it's, it's a tough time. So I'm, I'm looking for opportunities. If you have uh, it, it, any, um, any specific things that, you, that you've heard, I'm, I'm always on the search for extra ways that we can help. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think that um, I know the, the governor has been a real leader in thinking about the, the needs of farm workers as it relates to um, COVID-19, um, you know, trying to do a lot of different things related to contact tracing and because they weren't, they're not eligible for, many of them are not eligible for federal relief, um, you know, the state created funds and, and philanthropy has also stepped in to help, to help folks um, who are not eligible for some of the things like unemployment insurance and um, benefits. Um, so I, I will do some more thinking about the, this. I mean, it just feels that, like, you know, we talk a lot about um, uh, the challenges that students bring with them to the, to the classroom and, you know, farm worker communities uh, and, and the children of farm workers bring a number of challenges. And I know many of them are trying to decide and balance, you know, do I stay in school? My, my parents aren't able to work. Um, should I be helping them? Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, as we think about um, you know, the effects of COVID-19, how that's going to impact our students. I can see a number of them making that choice to, to drop out of school. Um, and so I think thinking about, um, you know, I'm not sure if there's student organizations on campus that might need additional support or maybe are doing interesting um, things to help, help people and support people, um, you know, even, even, if, even just emotionally, if not economically. Um, so something to maybe think about. And, and perhaps, uh, Chancellor, there are other, I'm sure that you know there are a number of obviously um, of our campuses that have farm worker communities uh, around them, and they may also be dealing with similar challenges. So I'm curious if there are some best practices out there about how to serve uh, migrant students um, uh, who make it, you know, who are able to overcome so many obstacles and make it to the uh, to college. Um, how we can think about supporting them, I think, would be something. Uh, good for us to think about and figure out if there are best practices to lift up for you know folks like Dr. Kraft who wanna who want and are eager to 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 learn about how to to further bolster support for these students. I, I would say very quickly that uh, in the beginning I showed you that our cabinet, um, Oscar De Haro, who is a vice president of, of student affairs, started his career here as a grape picker in a Bracero family, and um, so he's very aware um, and um, we're focused on every opportunity we can to, you know, to assist. It, I, actually, this lights me up. It gets me very excited about, you know, the help that we can do. So um, I'm, I'm very eager to do that. Thank you. So Dr. Can, you, can, can I have, you have time sure. for another question? Sure. Thank you. So Dr. Kraft, this is Pam Haynes. Um, you, had, you had mentioned that the gap between a certificate and an associate's degree is narrowing. Um, and I, I really appreciate that comment. I'm wondering to what extent the pay for that, that someone gets from that certificate would be the same. Is that also ex uh, increasing um, in a way that would be a benefit for those students who, who have certificates. And then as a part of that, um, it's very, well, it's not very clear. Um, 
the, the, the issues around the, the jobs in an area like Napa and in its surrounding areas that depend upon um, farm workers, to what extent are, are students, especially our Latino students, um, encouraged to make certain that they're continuing their education for, for those jobs that place them in the middle class? And are there strategies around that piece of it so that, um, so that they have you know, viable, good incomes that will allow them if they want to stay in Napa, but then they would, they would be um, privy to those kinds of jobs? Thanks for the question. Yeah, I think um, this is a dicey one. So, but what I would say, one of the values in a certificate is that it's more attainable in a short period of time. And life happens to students. So mm -hmm. getting a certificate along the way to, a, to, to a, an associate degree is a very smart move for, for people because it, it is, you know, attended Napa Valley College, you know, is not as good as a certificate in hospitality management or something else, something else. Right, which is real key for them. I think over the, the, the dollars and salary over the long run are still gonna show that if you have a college education, you're gonna earn, earn more over, your, over the long run. There are exceptions to that, um, but, but I think in, in aggregate now, you know, if we're just looking at metrics of earners, um, that's important. Pathways does present um, some of the, <clears throat> the kind of conversation you're, you're talking about and there's no two ways about it. Um, you, you know, a, a, a bachelor's degree is, is still a ticket to entry in, in many institutions, many businesses, they, they like that. Um, an AA degree, um, there is very little difference now in Napa County between an AA degree in wine and a BA degree in wine. Technology. Um, they're fairly even and because there's a lot of teaching on the ground that kind of happens, um, so to speak, but we're, we're a bit unique in that. Um, to, the, to the other piece, I think it's really important that um, all students kind of pick up, um, if, they're, if they're transferring, it's been a frustration for me for years that transferring student with 56 units doesn't get an, a degree. I mean, they transfer out and we lose them. So I think there are some initiatives. I just was talking to Joe Weiss and some other, some other folks. I mean, there are some initiatives that it reverse transfer degree programs that we, we need to get these students on paper, get, get them um, more credentials on paper. The more the credentials sells, that's all there is to it. For our, for our uh, hospitality industry, the wine industry is second now to the hospitality industry in Napa and our our Latino Latinx um, populations have really taken it on the chin. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that to the degree possible, we can, we can say, here is, here's one thing under your control. The one thing that you have control is you take the one class, get yourself into one class at least just to get them college you know, oriented. So we have found that um, the hurdles that we used to have in math and English are are not quite through AV705 um, is, is helping. Um, so people are entering you know, faster, succeeding faster. I'm, 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 I wish I had more time to unpack this, but um, know that we are um, kind of focused on this and that um, only time is gonna tell on this. Um, there are certs certainly in computer and technical fields that out earn a BA every day. <laughs> But um, that's an exception to the rule when you really kind of move across the United States. So we're, we're going to have to see where this goes. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kraft. I'm afraid that is going to have to wrap it up. Um, I do. Uh, I look forward to accepting your invitation to come out there to visit, and I hope other board members have an opportunity to do so as well. Metaphor. <laughs> if you all reach through the screens, I'm just going to give this to you now. Um, <laughs> we are. We are going to uh, ensure that the Board of Governors um, kind of receives this sample of our, uh, our hospitality soon. So if you receive some gift in the mail, that's what it is. Uh, okay. 
Thank you so much. And we, we really appreciate your support for the vision for success, for guided pathways and all that you're doing in your community. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, we, we respect and really appreciate the work that you all do. Um, it, it's, it's hard work and it, it's weighty work. And, um, and Chancellor Oakley, Eloy, thank you very much for your leadership. Okay, thanks again, y'all. Okay, thank you, sir. So um, our next step, we're gonna do uh, item 4.5, which was put over from yesterday, the uh, system budget and legislative request and capital plan. I, I, uh, I do wanna uh, ask uh, Vice Chancellor Navarrete to keep this as short as possible. We have a lot of public comment. Um, I think we've all had the materials. So uh, appreciate uh, brevity in your, uh, in your presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, members of the board. I appreciate um, all that you're doing today and uh, these extensive meetings. Um, I have the privilege today of presenting um, item 4.5, which is the 2021 system budget request and um, changes to the five-year capital outlay plan. So this is a two-part item. The board will be asked to consider approval of the 2021 budget and legislative request and changes to uh, the capital outlay plan. I am joined by my esteemed colleague, David O'Brien, Vice Chancellor of Government Relations. Next slide, please. I won't go over this too much, but um, as you all know, this is framed, um, our request is framed by what was once an anticipated six point six billion dollar general fund surplus in 2021, which quickly um, turned into a $54 billion deficit with lower revenue uh, estimates and higher costs. Next slide, please. This year, the legislature adopted multitude of budget solutions in order to address the shortfall um, and address um, the needs of our system, including community colleges. They included baseline adjustments, educational deferrals, cost shifts and borrowing, um, use of federal funds and reserves, increases in revenue and spending reductions. Next, I'll invite my colleague, David O'Brien. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I'm just gonna provide a little bit of uh, context about the advocacy environment and a bit of a recap of the process, but per the board president's instructions, I'll try to be quick. So we've discussed the worldwide economic recession. We've discussed the fact that given this sort of multi multiple state and national emergencies going on right now, um, the legislature has only had this year so much bandwidth in the administration to devote to higher ed, quite frankly. And that's not meant to be a knock on anyone. It's simply a reflection of the fact that with um, wildfires continuing to get worse every year, homelessness in our state housing crisis, and now all of that being exacerbated by the pandemic and the recession, this is the advocacy environment that we are in. But we continue to position our system as one of the key drivers of California's not just response to COVID, but also our economic recovery. And next slide, please. So quick recap of the process by which the chancellor's office team and our stakeholders developed this shared advocacy request. So we worked with our consultation council partners uh, first to begin developing the request based on our unmet budget and legislative uh, priorities from the previous year, as well as current year system needs that may have changed again due to the COVID crisis. Working with our consultation council members, we developed a preliminary list of priorities within the request. Uh, we then um, asked our consultation partners to rank them via survey that was sent out. We sent out the list to a much broader group of stakeholders, including our partners in the field at our districts and campuses for public comment. We received multiple public comments reviewed again in our executive team for alignment to the vision for success and other current priorities, including our diversity, equity, and inclusion work and the chancellor's recent call to action around racial justice. Uh, and now we are here, finally, uh, pleased to present to the Board of Governors for discussion, input, and final direction. And on the next slide, you will see uh, just the sort of broad overview of the major themes within this request we're bringing to you. Of course, foundational resources are essential. That is uh, more or less a standing in item in every year's budget request, but we can't forget the basic operational uh, support for our system. We're pleased to, see, pleased to have a focus on faculty and staff who are doing so much of the hard work as we uh, just heard from our campus partners. 
targeted resources to address student needs, including continuation of our student supports block grant and expansion of state supports to serve student needs. And so all of this is wrapped up within the theme of protecting the California community colleges from deep cuts and enabling our system to support their response and recovery. And I will turn it back over to Vice Chancellor Navarrete for a little bit of detail on some of the highlights within our uh, request. Great, thank you. Next slide. Our uh, request um, that is being presented to you for consideration includes two parts. Elements that are requests for Proposition 98 resources. Um, we highlight again that this was built off of the unmet needs of our system um, from 2021 and also a forward thinking into what we need um, in the future for um, a recovery that, um, as um, um, Dr. Ajose mentioned, uh, includes a focus on an equitable recovery. So you'll see many of the elements in here, um, combination of ongoing request and um, one-time request for foundational resources, ongoing requests, um, for a focus on faculty and staff, you'll see a highlight of implementation of this um, board's focus on the faculty and staff diversity task force recommendations. Support for part-time faculty, we've had extensive conversations with um, our consultation council members and we'll revisit the complete amount that is requested in the final um, uh, document that is put forward. And then I want to thank um, our partners and student leaders that have really helped us craft what is included with a focus on their needs. So uh, you'll see an inclusion of the block grant um, and supports for online education and student services in formats that will meet them where they are now and are cognizant of the dynamics of this pandemic. In the next slide, you'll see some non-98 requests that are also key uh, requests to continue uh, investing in capital outlay uh, to stimulate the economy. Uh, an expansion of mental health services from Proposition 63 funds and Cal Grant reforms. Though we know this is a challenging year, we can't lose sight of how valuable policy changes in Cal Grant reform can be. And then core supports for the Chancellor's Office operations. Um, so with that, those are the elements of the 2021 system budget request. The next part, I will go into discussing the five-year capital outlay plan. Next slide, please. So every year, um, consistent with the Board of uh, the uh, California Education Code and Title V, the Chancellor's Office prepares a five-year capital outlay plan that identifies statewide needs and priorities for community colleges. This year's um, capital outlay plan uh, covers um, through 2025-26 and includes a total of uh, need of $21.2 billion. Uh, in the attachments, you'll see uh, the full details um, of what is included in the infrastructure throughout our state and the overall need. And then if the remaining um, funds are consistently re released, uh, we are committed to utilizing uh, Proposition 51 funds through 2223. Next slide, please. In your packet, you also see an inclusion of capital outlay program updates. These key updates were made possible by many of our um, stakeholder and partners, and the entire purpose for these updates is to ensure that there is alignment with the vision for success and what we are consistent with the direction um, that this board has um, provided. The changes um, are key to ensuring that we streamline the way that we score projects for facilities, and um, they've streamlined from five categories to three. Those three categories are um, for fire, life, and safety, uh, for modernization, and for growth. Um, these take into consideration the new use of classrooms, high need, um, and the need for additional classroom and lecture space. Next slide, please. Lastly, I will cover additional changes to uh, space utilization. Uh, the last time this board um, updated space utilization and standards policies was in 2010. The new policy that is presented before you increases office, um, office type standards by 25% 
increases lecture type uh, standards by 33%. And these updates ensure that we are providing flexible use spaces that align well with curriculum changes, uh, guided pathways, and most importantly, are aligned with uh, the Division of State Architect and California State Mar Fire Marshal Safety Codes. So those are the pieces that you see in your whole packet of the capital outlay plan. Next slide, please. That completes your slides for this item. Thank you. So the next thing I'll just ask if there are any questions about any of these two items, whether uh, the, uh, the 2021 system budget request um, or the five-year capital outlay plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, open for board comments and questions. I have a comment. Um, I just want to say that when we hear the public comments, we're going to hear from several groups that are focused on assisting African American students. Um, as you know, in 2017, the Chancellor's Office created the Black African American Advisory Panel. It's a statewide panel. And they came out with reports in 2019. And in 2020, what we've tried to do is focus on three things. One is to, to uh, focus on continuing the panel from three to five years and and I think that'll happen because they're, the office is now making it a, a charter initiative. The second was to create a five-year strategic plan that identifies specific outcomes for black and African-American students in concert with the vision to success. And then the third focus will be on fully funding three programs that support African-American students, Amosia, Amanda, and the HBCU transfer program. And I think people will be calling in today regarding the fully full funding of those three programs. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Tom, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, go ahead. Um, so I'm gonna ground my comments in a couple of um, economic themes that are emerging that sounds kind of boring, but trust me, there's a point to it, which is that earlier this year, the legislative analysts described our potential post-pandemic recovery in terms of letters, um, a U-shaped recovery, which meant we would bounce back quickly, an L-shape, which would be longer. Um, but more concerning is economists are now talking about a K-shaped recovery. And what those two lines represent is, is an equity issue, candidly. Um, and we saw this in 2008 on its more pronounced, I think, uh, in this recovery, uh, which is that those that had means and um, income coming into the recovery are doing fine. And those that did not will be disproportionately impacted and the recovery will be longer for them. So all of this is a long way of saying that I think some of the component pieces are right in this proposal, but to board member Shaw's comment, um, I think our theme needs to be a little bit broader. Um, unequivocally, I think our system is the best place to help California with its disproportionate unemployment numbers get out of this mess economically. However, as we see in our vision for success, we really need to make sure that we have our, uh, our equity lens on in this work. Uh, and I know that resources are tight, um, but um, in tandem with the 2008 recovery, we are at risk of calcifying uh, inequity in our state um, to a degree we will not be able to recover. Um, and so I'd like us to work on the governor's theme of California for all, because our system stands at the crossroads of that. Um, and, um, you know, I know we've long talked about Cal Grant reform, and I don't want to dismiss that, but I also think that we as a system have an opportunity to look inward at areas, especially in light of online delivery, in which we as a system can reduce the total cost of attendance for our students in areas like textbooks, in areas of, you know, driving down transportation costs as people are learning more remotely. And so I would just encourage us again to look internally at some of those costs. Um, and then just one brief comment on the, the capital, which is on the growth projects, given what we've heard about our enrollment, um, do we really anticipate many capital projects that are uh, in the growth category? Thanks. 
And I'm happy to, to take a couple of those questions. Do you wanted to mention and highlight um, that we look forward to building in um, that key theme, couldn't agree more, that that's really important. Uh, um, and as you've shared, and many of you have shared in prior meetings, this system is best equipped to tackle the equity issues. We are in almost every corner of the state and, and serve the diversity um, of our state. And um, we will position ourselves and continue to work with the legislature and governor to remind them about our positionality for that. I want to uh, highlight page 14 on one of your links uh, for the system budget requests. That includes a major emphasis on protecting our categorical programs um, and um, highlighting the need for additional uh, support for resources um, that serve uh, Emoja Amend um, and um, some of the key um, themes that you'll hear from um, public commenters. So that is included in page 14 um, in the packet that is presented before you. And around capital outlay, that is one of the key considerations where we've looked at enrollment trends and this proposal, what it does, it emphasizes modernization first, um, recognizing that um, growth in the past was receiving higher scores and higher points. Now that um, has shifted to providing more points for modernization so that we can grapple with the realities of our demographics and our enrollment. So um, it really is, um, as it's ranked, um, fire life safety, modernization, and last is growth in terms of ranking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions from the board? I'd like to jump in with a, with a question, President Epstein. Um, ye yesterday, I inquired about where whether or not college buys could be used for uh, system textbook purchases, and just wonder if it was unrealistic as you know we think about all of the needs that students have with housing, hunger, um, Wi-Fi instability or instability, whether and, and they're trying to learn in this online environment, and whether they should be forced to purchase textbooks, and um, just wonder how the proposal address textbook costs, and if it doesn't, if there's a way that we can coordinate statewide to drastically reduce the cost of textbooks on students. Um, specifically, uh, is there room in the proposal, or is there still room in the budget to address this? And then is there a way to establish this as a part of the chancellor's office's equity center goals? The proposal includes a variety that, uh, of elements that are meant to tackle some of the disparities and uh, inequities that we're seeing in the new delivery format. So there are uh, a request for online infrastructures, um, and this includes both the need for platforms. So you'll see there um, space for tutoring, space for library services. We're also in the last year of implementation of a, a, a statewide efforts um, for uh, zero textbook cost degrees and open educational resources. This has been, um, we've had great champions within the academic Senate that have been uh, really focusing on this, not just on a goal of driving down the cost, but recognizing that there are some um, courses where we can provide uh, a, a course without a need for the cost of a textbook, significantly reducing some of the affordability challenges. So that um, is something that, um, again, we're very thankful for the Academic Senate that they've been leading um, through this multi-year effort. Uh, within the resources we request, there's enough flexibility where campuses can uh, use some of their funds for the uh, further implementation of the, those purposes. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I guess what I'm seeing is that the uh, the digital or zero cost textbooks is not scaling fast enough locally. And um, you know what? You know, I'm asking my district to specifically do is to study the feasibility of how we can reduce the cost or the amount of money we're spending around our categorical dollars. And theoretically, I'm hoping it will reduce the cost that students actually put out. And so. I guess what I'm asking is, can we? Is there more that we can do around this issue to lower the cost of textbooks? Um, when I was a student at the University of Phoenix, I went there for a couple classes, and I know their scale is a lot different than ours. But you pay $75 total, 
and you get all your books online. You can still order the book if you want to. And so I, we got to do more for students around textbooks. Um, you know, the, the digital, um, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's great, um, but it's been around for a while and I would like to see it, see it move faster. And so how do we negotiate with these publishers? How do we incentivize faculty to write more books? But just like, how do we get the cost of textbook down for, for students and specifically what I'm asking that could be part of the goals um, around the equity, the equity goals and, you know, if we can work towards that. Thank you. Board Member Williams, if I could jump in. Um, I, I think what the Board of Governors can do is what you're, <clears throat> what you're doing now is uh, I think both you and Member Costa have brought up the textbook cost. Th that, uh, you know, needs to be an area of emphasis if that's where the board wants the chancellor's office to, to uh, lean into. Um, and that's certainly something that uh, we can do in, in working with the governor's office, try to find ways to, to incentivize the scaling. Um, this is an issue that is, uh, needs um, the support of the statewide academic senate. Uh, we're, we're happy to continue to work through that, but but really, I mean, what you can do is make this an area of emphasis that the Board of Governors wants to see the system uh, begin to, to move into at a quicker pace. Um, and so as the Chancellor's Office team, we're happy to carry that message back to all the constituent groups uh, and uh, weave it into um, the vision for success. It is already woven into there, but it can rise in terms of an area of emphasis. Thanks, member Rawlings. Thank you. Um, Very just nice. a, a quick question. Um, I wanted to, to ask a little bit about the modernization and, and kind of make sure that our, our office has the, the eye on the ball. As we go kind of post pandemic, uh, we've got a lot of um, access to virtualization now. We've, we've learned how to build out virtual computer labs and things like that, reducing the demand for on-campus space. I really appreciate the space utilization updates. I think there's probably more we can do in that area, but that would probably come later. But thinking particularly about the physical spaces we currently have on our campuses and how we might reinvent them, uh, especially as uh, the advent of like flexible lab space, modular lab space is coming to being, uh, making sure that our space utilization guidelines uh, match those needs as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we thankfully have pulled some of the best minds from the state to inform us of how space is utilized on campus so that we can continually update um, our capital outlay plan, specifically space utilization, not just to meet the vision for success, but adapt to new ways of learning. So we'll continue to do that and happy to bring um, more updates to you as that work evolves. Perry. Member Williams, I just want to um, circle back to your question uh, that you raised yesterday and today about textbooks to follow up on what the foundation's been doing. Um, so College Buys, the program of the foundation has a partnership with a group called Vital Source, and uh, they are working to provide e-textbooks, which can cut costs by about 50% um, over physical textbooks. They should be available September, early October, 2020. Um, I'll give the foundation a push and a nudge to see um, if we can get that moving faster and also make sure that the word is out there because if you have a program that no one knows about, then it, um, it's, it's really not um, touching lives. And I wanna underscore a point that um, member Costa made about taking a wholesale look at how we reduce the cost of the system to our students. I'm not sure I've, we've framed it in that particular way before. We seem to be looking to the outside a lot as we should, but, um, I just want to underscore that I think that's an, an important point and, and, a, and a sort of a relook at how can we internally look at um, reducing the cost of the system to our students. Thank you. Is there any other public or any other uh, board member comments? Okay, well, thanks. And uh, Vice Chancellor Navarrete and O'Brien, uh, thank you for a brief uh, and uh, effective presentation with lots of good reading material and uh, set a model for the uh, for the team here. And uh, now we'll move into public comment, of which I understand there's quite a bit. 
Public comment period for this item is now open. Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom to make a comment to the board. If you're calling into the meeting, use star nine to activate the raise hand feature. A member of the chancellor's office will call on you to allow you to speak your public comment. You have a maximum of three minutes. So uh, Cynthia Olivo, I am going to uh, unmute your microphone and you can uh, I'm sorry, you, you have control of your microphone now and you can address the board. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Cynthia Olivo and I am the president and one of the founders of Colegas. I'm also the assistant superintendent vice president of student services at Pasadena City College. Colegas is a new organization that represents Latino, Latina, and Latinx professionals in the California Community College system so that we can realize more equitable conditions and outcomes for our students. We are an affiliate organization of the National Community College Hispanic Council of the American Association of Community Colleges. I am here to represent our support for the 2021-2022 budget and legislative request. It is student-centered, equity-focused, and we especially appreciate the request for Prop 98 one-time and ongoing funds for the implementation of the Faculty and Staff Diversity Task Force recommendations. We also really appreciate and acknowledge your leadership in supporting the Student Emergency Supports and Emergency Response Block Grants. And finally, our mental health Prop 63 request. We thank you to the Board of Governors for your leadership and support so that we can all realize the vision for success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Debbie Klein. I will give you control of your microphone. You can address the board. Thank you. Good morning, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the Board of Governors. This is Debbie Klein, President of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. FAC appreciates the consultation process that developed the system budget request. We understand that we have another difficult budget cycle ahead, and we believe a unified system voice will allow us to be most, most effective. We wanted to comment briefly on four pieces of the request. Firstly, we appreciate the focus on faculty, especially the support for more full-time faculty positions and the continued prioritization of the faculty and staff diversity task force recommendations. Second, we appreciate the focus on increasing support for part-time faculty who comprise 70% of our faculty and who remain grossly undersupported in our system. While 5 million is only a small portion of what will be needed, prioritizing part-time faculty within the system budget request is an important step in the right direction. Third, we appreciate the support for the library services platform, especially during this massive shift to online instruction across the system. And finally, FAC wants to ensure that the funding for EOPS and other categorical programs is preserved. If EOPS is not included in the budget request, FAC would be happy to collaborate with the Chancellor's Office in the writing of a letter to support EOPS, the original and most effective program to equi equitably provide resources to our students, as you all heard from the public comments yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Anastasia Dobson Bell. You have control of your microphone. You can address the board. Okay. Uh, hello. I'm not sure if anybody can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Anastasia Dobson Bell, and uh, I serve as the student personnel assistant for the Emoji Diop Scholars Program at Casimnes River College, which is within the Los Rios community college district. I'm also a CRC grad and I'm going to transfer to UC Davis in a matter of days. Uh, so I have a unique position as a, a student as well as staff. Um, I represent again the Emoji Diop Scholars Program, which primarily serves students of African descent. And uh, I want to speak and comment on support for 
funding, ongoing funding for their program. Uh, we, myself as a temporary staff member, um, I'm limited to a certain amount of days that I can work throughout uh, one school year, which means, you know, should my days come to a conclusion, students still have needs. And with there being limited staffing, um, that means that many students fall uh, short of what they need because there's just not enough staffing um, to serve their needs. So um, I am in full support and would like to encourage the funding of uh, categorical programs such as Emoja Diop Scholars and uh, additional programs as well. Thank you. Uh, next we have Josh Hagen. You uh, have control of your microphone. You can address the board. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chancellor Oakley, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, and members of the Board of Governors. My name is Joshua Hagen, and I'm providing comment on behalf of the Campaign for College Opportunity, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring more Californians have an opportunity to attend and succeed in college. In order to help students reach their full potential amid a historic global pandemic, it is now more critical than ever to ensure that our community college system receives necessary funding to support all of our students. The critical work that community college administrators, staff, and faculty do every day depends on robust funding from our state and federal governments. We're providing public comment today to urge the Board of Governors to support the Chancellor's Office system budget and legislative request. In particular, we would like to call attention to two items in this budget request that we feel are particularly important to advancing educational equity as we continue to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. First, the Student Emergency Supports and Emergency Response Block Grant. This much and still sorely needed funding provides an invaluable lifeline to our system's most vulnerable students. As unemployment continues to wreak havoc on students' educational journeys, far too many students are faced with difficult choices about if and how to continue on their path to their educational goals. This funding that this program provides can mean the difference between our most vulnerable students achieving an associate's degree, finding their way to transfer, and entering the workforce, or being forced to put their college dreams on hold. Second, we want to highlight the importance of the line items funding to meet current obligations and providing cost adjustments and core support for Chancellor's Office operations. The California Community College system was already chronically underfunded, and that was before the economic hardship of the pandemic began to unfold. As community colleges continue to play a vital role in training our first responders and frontline healthcare workers, we need to ensure that the Chancellor's Office and community colleges are financially supported Many, if not all, community college districts have already faced enormously difficult budgeting decisions and will continue to grapple with the economic fallout of the pandemic in the coming months and years. It is our responsibility to ensure that we do everything in our power to advocate for increased funding to the system to safeguard the promise of access and timely progress towards success for community college students. Thank you for your leadership and consideration. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Donald Moore. You have control of your microphone and you can address the board. Good, good afternoon. I mean, good, e uh, good morning, actually. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies, uh, President FC. Uh, yes, my name is Donald Moore. I am the District Academic Senate President at Peralta Community Colleges. And uh, I wanted to make reference to uh, what is going to be discussed today uh, regarding Peralta. Uh, our community... I'm afraid this is a different item. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, the okay. Peralta... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but the, the, the Peralta item will be later in the day, probably certainly afternoon. So we'd appreciate if you could make your comment that this is about our budget request. I will do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Ya Wiaf. You have control of your microphone and you can address the board. Good morning, uh, members of the board. My name is Ya Wiaf. I am also uh, a student um, at UC Riverside. Um, I'm a board member for uh, the Emoji State Program. And I just really wanted to thank everybody for considering this budget request and want to further emphasize how this is going to help 
uh, programs such as Umoja, um, with a budget increase, we'd be able to spread our um, influence and we'd be able to help more students um, the way that we have been doing for the past several years. I also want to further emphasize that a budget increase would also help us service those who are in need with laptops, with um, services that would uh, that students would greatly benefit from. So I just want to further emphasize that a budget increase would really help African American students and help us revolutionize their educational outlook and further improve their performance in schools. Thank you very much. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next we have Nzinga. Your microphone is enabled and you can address the board. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Board of Governors. I'm so happy to be able to briefly address you. Uh, most recently, I serve as the Amoja uh, Executive Director, and it, um, it's, it has come as one of uh, just my most um, um, d imaginative goals in terms of what Amoja does for African American students. I have been in higher education for 30 years doing work on behalf of uh, students of color at the University of California at Berkeley. I have served as an adjunct in the Peralta and the uh, Contra Costa system and also worked on an inaugural program for African American girls and achievement as well as girls of color for the Oakland Unified School District. And so I say it's my most imagined position because Amoja really directly touches so many African American students and provides them the opportunity to be able to think beyond what maybe their family circumstances are, their environment circumstances are, and to really think about the possibility of going to college and, and changing the conditions of their family and their community. And so when we think about a Moju that is now in 68 schools, we would love to be in as many schools as possible because we know the cohort model that has been researched tremendously over the course of many years is a model that works. And so to the extent that we can expand our reach and ensuring greater opportunity for the students who have the, the most challenges in, inside of our uh, public education systems, I just want to implore you how very importantly it is to continue our support of African-American students and, and supporting this proposal particularly during a time of COVID when we know those conditions can be uh, even worse. I'm so honored to be able to talk to you all. I hope you will take in high consideration of approving this, uh, this budget as presented. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the uh, next commenter has also submitted a written comment. Um, did you want to hear the, the comment Verbally. I think that verbally would be better, just uh, Christina should eliminate the written one. Okay. Uh, Mia C. Williams, uh, you have control of your microphone and you can address the board. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Clarice Williams. I am a voter, I am a student, I am an educator, and I am a regional coordinator for the Umoja Community Education Foundation. And I am pleased to share my support for the system budget legislative request. Um, there is a need to level the playing field for black students in higher education. That was mentioned earlier. Programs like the EOPS program, Puente Project, and Veterans Programs do excellent jobs at supporting their specific targeted populations while maintaining a pulse on the political landscape of California, right? Well, we as Umoja would like an opportunity to grow in that same way. We want an opportunity to be funded for decades with ample time to perfect our administrative, operational, and programmatic processes. We want an opportunity to be held closely by the state of California, to be valued as an indispensable support system and guided pathway for Black students. Yesterday, in the Diversity, Equity, 
and inclusion portion of the meeting, there was a consistent recurring suggestion to include students in the work of DEI, but we forgot to mention, however, that students must be prepared and professionally developed so that they can have greater success and impact in their advocacy. Let us not forget that the Umoja program is a program that develops our students to speak and to work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. Umoja is a guided pathway to success, degree attainment, and anti-racist civic engagement. We want to do more than survive. We want to thrive. We appreciate the support covering our basic needs as a statewide foundation with over 68 programs, but the funds cover the most basic of our programmatic needs, a basic budget, yields basic skills and basic results. Umoja is proud of the narrative of resilience, but we need to shift that narrative from resilience, from having to grow without resources. Please revisit the budget, grant us the funds that we need to push beyond resilience and move into a consistent state of excellence. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, yes, we do have one more. Uh, Jonathan Henderson, you have control of your microphone. You can address the board. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Henderson. Thank you for giving me time to speak. Um, I am an Amoja Regional Coordinator over the San Diego area. And uh, like my colleague, Maya Williams, I do want to speak on behalf of the Budget Augmentation for Amoja Community Education Foundation but I would like to speak from it, not as a regional coordinator, but as an Amoja alumni. Um, I was an Amoja alumni 12 years ago at Maricosta College. And, you know, kind of going into to college as a, a first generation college student, I didn't necessarily know what to expect, but because of the, the love and the rigor and, that was shown and the really, really the dedication from the counselors and, and, and all of the staff that were there that supported me, you know, I was able to succeed not only in the program itself, but in life. And so what I really want to, to say today is that Amoja not only serves to increase outcomes for Black students, but it will also serve to create citizens that are equity-minded, civically engaged, and passionate about transforming their communities and their institutions. And so for me, aside from transferring, right, getting a bachelor's degree, getting a master's degree, and then in, in 20, 2021, being able to obtain my doctorate degree in community college leadership at San Diego State University, I have also worked, you know, to establish uh, the, the um, Male Success Alliance program at California State University Dominguez Hills, which has impacted hundreds of students and, and grew to become the CSU's premier male success initiative, right, in the CSU system. Uh, I've also been a site coordinator for the Children's Defense Fund Los Angeles area, where we started the first all-male freedom school in, in California that, that produced many outcomes for African-American and Latino male, male middle school and high school students. I also served as the founding project coordinator of the Rose Black Resource Center, uh, and, and that was the first affinity space at California State University Dominguez Hills for African American students. I've also taught, right, in the Labor Studies Department, Black Studies Department, you know, counseling at San Diego State University, and then also in the Department of Sociology. And, and, and all of that culminated into me coming back to a moment to give. And, and um, you know, and the last thing that I want to say, because I know my time is short, um, is that all of that would not have happened without the training that I received a part of Emoja Community Education Foundation. This is not anecdotal, right? There are many examples of, of, of different alumni that have, that serve in, in the community college system and give and, and have produced the same outcomes that I have. And, and what you choose today will have a, what you choose to do today will have a ripple effect that will not only impact the students they serve, but also thousands of other students that they give to in the future. So thank you for your time. Thank you and congratulations on all you've accomplished. Um, Christina, are there written comments? Yes, President Epstein, I have received about 30 written comments. I have provided those names for you in the chat. 
I can read for you a couple, and these will be provided to the board. So they, they're, they're largely making similar points, is that the? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. So first I will read. Hello, my name is Jordan Robinson. I'm a second year at Narco College. I'm also an ICC representative on behalf of Narco College's Emoja program. I'm emailing today to bring light to the amazing work on Emoja at Norco College. They truly care about the academic and non-academic wellness of their students. Being within this program going on to my second year, I've come to love this program personally since day one because of the support I've gotten with classes, books, counseling, etc. Emoja at Norco College, I truly believe additional funding could not only impact the student currently within the program greatly, but those not yet reached. By this, I mean with the funds allocated to the program will help expand the program beyond the walls of Norco College, reaching out to more students, bettering the lives of the community and its individuals. The next, which I will time, is from uh, uh, Teresa Eldridge, President, Board of Directors from the Emoja Community Education Foundation. Dear members of the Board of Governors, on behalf of the Emoja Community Education Foundation, I am pleased to share our support for the 2021-22 system, budget, and legislative request. This budget request acknowledges through an equity lens the challenges of the current economic conditions while also ensuring that California leaders are strategically focused on the needs of our 2.1 million diverse community college students. A particular value to our students and colleges is the request for 3.5 million ongoing for Emoja to provide grants to each of the 66 Emoja affiliated programs across the system. Funding for full implementation of the California Community College Transfer Guarantee to HBCU program and 1.1 million in funding for expansion of A2 men student charters from 16 to 50 to have a greater impact on the academic success of African American males in higher education in California. These signature programs have a track record of getting students through the system of higher education despite the many hurdles and barriers our students face every day on our college campuses. In particular, Emoja has grown from a grassroots effort to be the prominent global educational organization that provides transformative, emancipatory education to uplift and inspire academic excellence and self-actualization for students of African descent. However, the lack of stable funding has created a backlog of additional program onboarding and the instability of program support or of campus support. Our years of hard work and determination, coupled with the extraordinary leadership and support of the champions at the chancellor's office, like former Chancellor Bryce Harris and Vice Chancellor Linda Michalowski, and our former fearless and our fearless leader, Chancellor Eloy Oakley, we who set forth the vision for success as a compass to ensure that all students, particularly our most marginalized students, would have the support needed to help them reach their full potential. Lastly, she says, further, we are in strong support of funding for, this, for the suite of recommendations by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force and the reform of the Cal Grant funding process. We applaud the Board of Governors for standing by their dedication to fighting for the best system in higher education for our students. We look forward to joining together with the Board of Governors and the Chancellor's Office in advocacy during the 21-22 budget and legislative process. Okay, thanks. And I just want to uh, say for the record of, uh, that we understand there are a number of other comments uh, in support of Emoja, and I'm going to read the names of the people who submitted comments uh, that we weren't, don't have time to read. Brian Rivas, Dr. Denise Nolden, Dr. Teresa Aldridge, Dr. Scott Thayer, Dr. Bonnie Bornstein, Dr. Jennifer Vega Lacerna, Dr. Judy Mays, Zima Creason, Anna Alvarado, Adisa Lam Teki, Danny uh, Peshin, Ariana Oliveira, Katrina King, Malcolm Morgan, Eric Anthony Ivory, Anita Bailey, Dr. Trelisa Glazatov, Dijon Shelton, Walter Turner, Natisha Hudson, Lakeisha Flowers, Fred Akuban, Amofa Brabi, uh, India Marsh, Jordan Robinson, Ken Times, Tom DeWitt, Jamila Stewart and Dolores Davidson. We thank you all for your comments and uh, for your support for Emoja.
So with that, are, are we completed with public comment? Okay, I understand that uh, Member Fitzgerald has a comment he'd like to make. Thank you, yeah, just yes. a brief statement. Um, appreciate it, President Epstein. I really just wanted to, um, you know, really thank the students for coming out today and um, remind them that their voice is extremely powerful. And the more we hear their voice in this way, the greater our system will become in serving its students. So a huge thank you um, to these students for coming out. And I, I wanted to point out um, uh, briefly one comment I heard that really rang in my ears, which was that, you know, the, the conversation yesterday about the DEI work, um, there was a student who mentioned, you know, this work could not be done without the resources to back that work, um, without the resources from the administrations um, to train these students to participate in effectively in hiring committees, um, in participatory governance, and their ASO. It's about the administration prioritizing the student voice. Um, the heart of the vision for success is about equity through empowerment. And so, um, you know, the same logic should be applied uh, to uh, the student perspective, I think, in all aspects of governance um, within our colleges. And once we realize that empowering our students um, through equity in this way um, really serves to selfishly empower our institutions, um, we will be a lot better off. So again, thank you to all the students that came out today and I hope I will continue to hear your voices um, in the future. Thank you. Are there any other board comments before uh, we take a motion? Okay, I just like to say one thing about the budget. Um, I think uh, I agree with all the comments the other board members made. And I think one of the crucial uh, ways that we can support our lowest income students is to work with the governor's office and other advocates to try and achieve universal broadband access that's affordable to everyone. Um, obviously, we'd like to see the uh, community college students uh, prioritized, but for this state to really be fair to everyone, we need universal broadband. Um, you know, access where it doesn't even exist today and affordable access where it exists, but, but people can't afford to buy it. So uh, I would urge uh, our team, our staff to make that a priority to, to, uh, to work with. We know there are others who are very interested in this and to, uh, to advocate vociferously for that as well. Um, with that, we'll take a motion to uh, ad adopt the budget. So moved. Second. Second. I think uh, I think Rawlings beat Anderson to the punch on the second. So it's uh, Sean Rawlings. Um, okay, please call the roll. Hildegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Darius Anderson. Yes. Amy Costa. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Aye. Cullum Fitzgerald. Aye. Jolina Grande. Aye. Pamela Haynes. An enthusiastic aye. Eleni Konalakis. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Aye. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Alma Salazar. Aye. Valerie Shaw. Aye. Blas Lobos. Aye. Joseph Williams. Aye. Okay, uh, the item is adopted. We will now move to the first reading uh, section with uh, item 5.1. And uh, item 5.1 is a first reading and public hearing for proposed amendments to Title V of the California Code of Regulations promulgating section 55052.5 related to international baccalaureate and or college level uh, examination programs. And the item will be presented by the Chancellor's Office staff. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, President Epstein. I am Aisha Lowe, Vice Chancellor of Educational Services and Support, bringing this item before you for first read. So these regulations have been developed in partnership with the Academic Senate and our 5C Curriculum Committee, and we thank them for their partnership and collaboration. 
They have also been reviewed by our Office of General Counsel and went to Consultation Council in August where no opposition was presented. So currently our colleges locally adopt standards for awarding course credit and performance levels for IB, International Baccalaureate, and the CLEP, as uh, President Ibsen said, the college level examination program examination. This results in differing local policies and practices. The proposed regulations require the chancellor in collaboration with the academic senate to develop policy guidelines on the minimum passing scores and units for the IB and CLEP examinations. Those will be distributed annually and will be designed in alignment with similar policies from CSU. These proposed regulations complement our broader uh, regulations around credit for prior learning that were approved last September and will create consistency and equity in this process, uh, which supports our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and also supports our vision for success. And with that, I will open it for questions or comments. Um, can I just thank you? Some? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for that concise presentation. Appreciate it. Um, I want my comments concise too, Tom. Um, <laughs> this is like really heady academic stuff, but I do just want to point out how important it is for our students to be able to use the CLEP and the IB um, to demonstrate their knowledge um, and for credit. And so I just want to give kudos to the chancellor and his staff. Um, this is really wonky, but really uh, material for our students. And so thank you um, and uh, to the Academic Senate as well, who I assume was part of this process and to all of our stakeholders. Thank you. So Tom, this is Pam. Um, I do have um, a question and that is, well, one, congratulations that we're going to have um, a process across our colleges that um, is, is standardized in a way that um, it's transparent on what, what the expectations are in terms of the, the, the coursework and the exams. But I'm wondering, um, this still, does this still have to go um, and, uh, with some type of approval from the uh, CSUs and the UCs? So right now, both of these examinations, uh, well, well, in particular, IB is accepted at both CSU and UC and CLEP examinations are accepted at CSU. Right, so there's already sort of that intersegmental collaboration. What we are doing is as opposed to um, all of our districts locally deciding what score actually means that a student's pass one of these exams, we're setting a unified standard. And then once a student passes an exam, then that credit can transfer over to the four years. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations. Are there any other board comments? Yes. Can I, President Epstein? Sure. Congratulations on this achievement. Uh, I'm really excited to see it on the board's agenda. It's really important for students that there is a unified uh, standard that they can be sure of, because I know a lot of students wouldn't just submit their scores just because one student would get one score and the other would not. And they, it's just easier for them to take the class again rather than uh, go through the whole hassle of application and waiting for what's going to happen next. So I really appreciate all the efforts that's being done in systematic, um, in systematization of this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board comment? Okay, um, so I don't have a gavel. I'm supposed to bang the gavel. I'm going to bang my uh, Santa Barbara City College coffee mug instead. The public hearing on item 5.1, the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations Title V, Section 55052.5 is now open. The purpose of the hearing is for the Board of Governors to receive comments and testimony from members of the public regarding the proposed regulatory action. At this time, the floor is open for comments from the public. Uh, Dolores Davison, you have control of your microphone and you can address the board. Good morning, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley and members of the Board of Governors. Uh, Dolores Davison, President of the Academic Center for California Community College is. Uh, first of all, I would like to recommend that uh, President Epstein get a gavel because I would hate for him to break his mug. Um, 
Second of all, uh, my co public comment was linked with the Emoja comments and we very much uh, support those, but I also wanted to let you know that we do support the library services platform. So please include that in the public comment around the budget request. Finally, I would like to offer my congratulations to both the Chancellor's Office and to our colleagues on 5C uh, for this uh, particular piece of regulation. Uh, this will definitely move the needle in terms of our equity efforts. And we're very proud of the work that was done and we are very grateful to the Chancellor's Office for our partnership. Thank you very much. Are there, any are there any additional members of the public who would like to speak on this matter? President Epstein, I have not received public comment via email at this time. Okay. Hearing none, this public hearing is closed. This concludes the public hearing on this matter. Uh, since this is a first reading, we will not be taking action. And we can go on to uh, the next item. Uh, item 5.2, Proposed Correspondence Education Regulations. All right, good morning again, everyone. Aisha Lowe, Vice Chancellor of Educational Services and Support. Uh, so we have another set of proposed regulations coming before you. These two have been developed in partnership with 5C, re recommending uh, additions to Title V to establish correspondence education as an alternative method of instruction. We are bringing these proposed regulations before you for first reading. They have been reviewed by our general counsel and went before consultation council in August where there was no opposition. Uh, so this in some ways is a regulatory cleanup. In March 2019, correspondence education was removed uh, from up under distance education to align with federal statute which designated that correspondence education is not a form of distance education. The proposed regulations reestablish correspondence education as an improved method of instructional eligible, uh, of instruction, excuse me, eligible for apportionment. Uh, these proposed regulations are consistent with other regulations that fall under the alternative delivery method, such as those for distance education. And maintaining this instructional methodology is essential for courses taught in prisons and jails and for our rural communities. So with that, again, I will stop for any questions or comments. Thank you. Item 5.2 is a first reading and public hearing for proposed amendments to Title V of the California Code of Regulations, adding new sections 55260 through 55265 related to correspondence education. Do members of the board have any comments? Was that upset? Member Fitzgerald. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vice Chancellor Lowe. This is, you know, really great. And there's been a lot of equity concerns from students um, when it comes to, you know, correspondence education and, and you know, the California Community Colleges like um, a John De Lose, uh, um, you know, said at the beginning of the meeting where we had to do this rapid shift. And because of this, um, you know, rapid shift um, that we had to do, colleges adapted quickly and many times there were some uh, procedures and, and policies around correspondence education that left students behind and I want to point out a couple of those but first um, point out my favorite part of this which is it talks about the correspondence education instructor contact which is such a fundamental part of um, student success in, in correspondence education. Um, there are two concerns related to this that I've heard increasing uh, exponentially uh, from students across the state related to uh, this topic. The first concern is, has to do um, with uh, programs that I brought up um, such as Respondus Lockdown and Proctorio where um, these extremely strict uh, security programs which are meant to deter plagiarism or um, kind of malpractice in, in, um, in test taking um, really actually create tremendous equity concerns. And as an example, students have come forward saying, you know, where the program will track their eye movement, their, um, everything they're saying, um, and everything they're doing on the computer, their little brother has come into the room and because they don't have, uh, you know, they're not a monk and they're not living in a sanctuary on top of a mountain, their brother will come in the room, make the slightest bit of noise, and if they turn around, they fail their test 
And oftentimes professors, for whatever reason, won't care and will just keep that F. Um, so I, I'm, you know, as half of my question, I, I would like to see, um, or, or at least know if it's possible, if the Chancellor's Office has, has thought about um, where it might include um, guidance uh, against uh, equity concerns related to those type of programs and if it's feasible to include that in some way in here. Um, and and uh, the, the second concern I have uh, heard from students across the state when it relates to um, correspondence education is the inclusion of um, synchronous classes in the syllabus. And what I mean by this is, you know, like I said, this pandemic hit quickly. Um, and so professors and institutions as a whole had to adjust quickly. Um, and as a result of that, um, some professors are requiring students to attend a specific time slot um, on specific days when that time slot was not mentioned on the syllabus, synchronous education. Um, that for obvious reasons creates a huge equity concern during the pandemic um, as people struggle to uh, work and um, you know, are not able to make it to that time slot when it was not priorly agreed upon. Um, so again, wondering if the Chancellor's Office has done any work to address those concerns. Uh, for obvious reasons, students believe that if there's going to be a time slot required to attend, it should be listed on the syllabus. And if that's worth mentioning in this, um, uh, these uh, you know, regulations or somewhere else. Thank you very much for that, Member Fitzgerald. Uh, so do know we are aware of both of the issues that you have raised um, and they're issues we're looking into. And we're definitely happy uh, to follow up with you and the rest of the board um, on those, those particular issues. Now, those would both be specific to distance education and not quite relevant to these regulations, right? So these regulations around correspondence education, we're talking about a very small portion um, of our system and our FTES. Uh, we're typically um, often far prison and jail programs, uh, some of our rural community colleges, where you literally have the passing along of materials um, from student to professor in a correspondence mode um, and not those particular issues. But do know we are aware um, and we will follow up with next steps. Thank you. Yeah. Member Aguinaldo. Vice Chancellor Lowe, thank you very much for preparing a presentation on this. I just have uh, one quick question. Would it be possible for you to describe further what, how this impacts our justice involved students? Our incarcerated students get primarily getting this method of education. I was hoping you'd just provide some more detail around that. Yes, yeah, so definitely thank you for that. So uh, as I mentioned very briefly, I was trying to keep it short given you know, direction from President Epstein, uh, but as I mentioned very briefly, this particular methodology is essential for our students who are taking courses in prisons and jails. Um, of course, given the reality of being in prison or, or jail, right, the correspondence of materials is one way to ensure that we can serve those students. This was essential during this pandemic. When face-to-face -face courses in our prisons and jails had to shut down, uh, unlike our campuses, we did not have the technological capability to shift the distance education within prisons and jails. So the majority of those programs have had to shift to correspondence education. Uh, so that's another reason why this methodology is important. Our students who are in prisons and jails are working towards degree completion. They are working towards ADTs and having correspondence education is really essential for us to continue to serve that population. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Any other board comments? Okay. Public hearing on item 5.2, the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations, Title V, sections 55260 through 55265.5 is now open. The purpose of the hearing is for the Board of Governors to receive comments and testimony from members of the public regarding the proposed regulatory action. At this time, the floor is open for comments from the public. Uh, so we do have uh, one comment from the public currently, and Dolores Davison, uh, you have control of your microphone and you can address the board. Good morning, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the Board of Governors. I am still Dolores Davison, President of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. 
I wanted to thank Vice Chancellor Lowe, General Counsel Mark LaForestier, and the members of 5C. Uh, we've worked on these regulations for, as Vice Chancellor Lowe mentioned, quite some time now. We are very pleased with them, uh, especially regarding how they will uh, work with our Rising Scholars Program and our students that are currently incarcerated. And we are uh, very glad that the Board of Governors has been willing to hear this, and we look forward to these going forward. Thank you. President Epstein, I have not received any public comment via email at this time. Are there any additional members of the public who would like to speak in this matter? Hearing none, the public meeting, public hearing is closed. This concludes the public hearing on this matter. So uh, a quick uh, vote for the board. Are, are you all ready for a short break or should we continue to plow through? Please. Uh, signal on the screen. Thumb, thumbs up means a break. Is that it? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it seems to be kind of, uh, all right, well, it's, we will take a, let's see, it's 11, 12, according to my phone. Let, let's reconvene. Tom, are we going to have a lunch break today? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, feel free to, uh, turn off your uh, video and run to the kitchen for a minute. Uh, so um, yeah, it's because we still have some, a lot of comments and a lot of, uh, a few items that we think are gonna take a while coming up. So, okay, let's take a break till- uh, 11.30. 11.20. Till and uh, reconvene then, thanks. Not sure if everybody's really back yet. Um, I think I am facing a little bit of a coup here over the lunch break. Um, I, uh, I don't want to be arbitrary. So um, if, uh, if you want a lunch break, um, please, uh, please put it into the chat and we can, we can do that. We, uh, you know, maybe uh, after these, uh, after the regs are finished and uh, we get through a few more items. But, uh, so uh, I don't see a lot of video yet, so let's wait until we get more people on so we can uh, have a virtual vote. Just trying to power through for a late lunch. Okay, so um, for the board members that are on the screen, if, you, uh, if you'd like to take a lunch break, please do a thumbs up. And if you uh, would prefer to power through, please do a thumbs down and we can take a, a, an informal vote here. Sounds like no lunch break is the, uh, is the verdict. Sorry, Jennifer. It's okay, I'm, I was too much to vote. <laughs> Okay, um, so now we're up to uh, item 5.3, the first reading on the distance education uh, attendance accounting regulations. Item 5.3 is a first reading and public hearing for proposed amendments to Title V of the California Code of Regulations, amending sections 58003.1 and 58009 related to distance education attendance accounting. This item will be presented by the Chancellor's Office. Hi, good morning, uh, Lizette Neverett, Vice Chancellor College Finance. Again, I am pleased to present to you a first reading item on proposed regulatory changes on distance education attendance accounting. 
Uh, the issue here um, that uh, we are trying to resolve is that current regulations prescribe attendance accounting methods, which actually result in lower FTES, a full-time equivalent student, yields for distance education courses using a compressed calendar model. Uh, the intent of these regulations is to resolve that discrepancy. Next slide, please. I just provide a little bit of background as to the issue. Um, currently, courses that are provided in a traditional calendar um, based on the formula that's included in these regulations yield um, a term length multiplier amount that is much higher. And so what we are trying to do is resolve this discrepancy in light of the very um, a more innovative approaches that colleges are taking to offer their classes. Um, so this recommendation would replace the term length multiplier by 17.5. As a result, um, courses that are offered in a compressed calendar would receive the same resources as a course offered in a traditional calendar. And so we're looking at this um, as irrespective of the calendar type. Just in the next slide, briefly, want to mention that um, we do have protections in place that are currently available for colleges, um, also under Title V, um, as we address other changes and um, improvements that are needed around attendance accounting for distance education. So it is something we've heard from the field. We are looking at it closely and working with key stakeholders. Next slide, just briefly share that um, other areas we are looking at include non-credit open entry and open exit courses and um, we are also excited to be working side by side with my colleagues in education services to look at attendance accounting for competency-based education courses so again uh, present to you this item 5.3 as a first reading in hopes of addressing some discrepancies between compressed calendar and traditional classes in distance ed. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Comments or questions from the board? Uh, Member Grande. Thank you, President Epstein. And thank you, Vice Chancellor Navarrete. I was wondering if you might be able to provide a little bit more historical background on why there was a discrepancy between the two originally, and if at any point in time, we might get rid of the term length multiplier entirely and just have a set figure. Thank you. So um, the regulations around attendance accounting haven't essentially been revisited in many years, um, some as much as 20 years. We are currently reviewing many of them to identify where there are discrepancies. One uh, possible reality based on our records is just that there wasn't an estimation that distance ed would be used as widely as it is being used now. And so um, that is one of the reasons we believe that you see these differences. Um, there are also um, some differences in terms of uh, distance ed for uh, course types, and it's believed that that was an accountability measure. We are working with stakeholders and recognize that we don't want classes to lose resources at this time. And uh, these models have been known to help students uh, advance completion. So, thank you. Any other board comments? Tom, I have a question. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Navarrete. I'm wondering if you have any estimates on what the net impact of FTEs will be um, with this change. We don't have a net estimate currently. We know that um, about uh, 67 colleges are currently offering uh, compressed calendar classes and um, their estimates of this uh, uh, pay period or essentially um, uh, FTS period showed that this uh, regulation was causing a decline in their resources. So it's something we definitely want to address early and are bringing this to you. I'm happy to look into further, um, further estimates about what this would yield. Any other board comments? Okay. Well, um, Dolores Davison will be very pleased to know that my wife was once chair of a local school board and she has a gavel 
and I am banging the gavel. The public hearing on item 5.3, the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations, Title V, sections 58003.1 and 58009 is now open. The purpose of the hearing is for the Board of Governors to receive comments and testimony from members of the public regarding the proposed regulatory action. At this time, the floor is open for comments from the public. Uh, we do have uh, Debbie Klein and your microphone is enabled. Go ahead and address the board. Thank you. Good morning, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the Board of Governors. This is Debbie Klein, President of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. FAC appreciates Vice Chancellor Navarrete's work on this proposed regulations change. This issue came to our attention through the concerns of FAC members. We're pleased that this action would help to ensure that colleges are not penalized for offering more online courses during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. We do not have any more uh, verbal comments. And we have not received any written. Okay, are there any additional members of the public who would like to speak on this matter? Hearing none, the public hearing is closed. This concludes the public hearing on this matter. Okay, so moving on to um, the next uh, item, item 4.4, 5.4, first reading, direct assessment of competency-based education regulations. Item 5.4 is a first reading and public hearing for proposed amendments to Title V of the California Code of Regulations, adding new sections 55260 through 55260.13 related to direct assessment competency-based education. The item will be presented by the Chancellor staff. Thank you very much, President Epstein. Good morning, everyone. Again, this is Aisha Lowe, Vice Chancellor of Educational Services and Support. Very excited to bring forward this historical and landmark set of regulations for our system. Coming before you for first read, uh, as President Epstein said, proposed regulations to establish direct assessment competency-based education programs as an instructional method within the California Community College system. What you have before you today is the result of many months of a scaffolded learning journey uh, that we took with our 5C Curriculum Committee and the Academic Senate, in which we learned about competency-based education and examined different models of CBE, as well as research on CBE to inform the regulations that are under review today. Additionally, uh, we did contract with an equity expert uh, to engage in this process to ensure that the development of these regulations would be culturally responsive. These regulations have gone before the Office of General Counsel and went before Consultation Council last week where there was no opposition presented. There was one key question that was raised during Consultation Council that I will address shortly. So at the January 2020 Board of Governors meeting, the Chancellor's Office presented a report on competency-based courses and programs as well as online courses under a flexible calendar. That report defined and discussed the different models of competency-based education and really elucidated the need for direct assessment CBE programs for our system. And that report concluded, and I quote, that the Chancellor's Office should design an alternative approval process for direct assessment competency-based education offerings and specify policies and regulations to govern this process. The regulations before you today are a result of that work. So competency-based education provides many benefits and will serve as an important lever for the vision for success. For the sake of time and brevity, I will not go into the details of the distinguishing factors of this methodology. Uh, those are in your digest. But do know that competency-based education is particularly well suited for our working adult students and provides a path to degree for the many students who have some college but no degree. CBE has been cited as a strategy for skill upgrading, for closing unemployment and underemployment gaps, and for more expansive degree attainment by the Lumina Foundation, the California Edge Coalition, and numerous academic researchers. Additionally, the language proposed is consistent 
with the California Online Community College Act of 2018 and language included in the 2020-2021 state budget may revise, both of which highlight competency-based education as an innovative practice that is to be pursued. Lastly, to address uh, the one question that did come up during consultation council around why uh, these direct assessment competency-based education programs are specifically online or hybrid. Wanted to acknowledge that that was a question that 5C carefully grappled with and carefully considered and unanimously decided on. And that's because these programs, these innovative programs being high, online or hybrid is actually critical to provide the flexibility intended by these programs. We want uh, everyone to understand that with a direct assessment competency-based education program, we're talking about an entirely new way of teaching and learning. So the goal here is not to remain within existing curricular structures and simply transition to competencies, but to create innovative degree programs that are student-centered and highly flexible. Additionally, when we had a chance to talk directly with students who were in other CPE programs, the online flexibility was a key distinguishing factor students cited that they needed that flexibility to engage in learning in the evenings and on weekends to accommodate their work schedules and their family life. Now that said, please know these regulations are a starting point for system-wide competency-based education, not the end point. We will work through the details of implementation through a comprehensive pilot that we are developing uh, to further refine our regulations as needed and to create a blueprint for developing these programs system-wide. We will then further expand CBE to face-to-face -face programs and to certificate programs. And with that, I will open it for questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, any uh, board member, uh, member Grande? Thank you, President Epstein. I have several questions uh, regarding the document, so I'll go through them um, in the order that uh, they appear in the document. Under 55260.1 definitions, um, you just mentioned that at some point in time, there would be an expansion beyond degrees into certificates and beyond online into face-to-face. -face. Is there a particular reason why um, under letter D, direct assessment competency-based education, it currently is limited to just earning a college degree, why it was necessary to place degree within that particular definition? Yes, thank you for that, Member Grande. So the reason that we have taken this approach, we being the Chancellor's Office in 5C, is because we really are trying to uh, push this as a lever for innovation within our system, in particular within our degree programs. And so our hope, our vision, is that if we focus on creating a, a blueprint for degree programs, we can then scale to certificates and other programs uh, versus the converse, uh, that if we start uh, with certificates, we may never then get to the level of actually implementing degree programs. Uh, so in many ways, it is strategic, right, that we want to focus the initial pilot um, and these initial programs on degree programs, knowing that we can then scale uh, back from there. Uh, but we want to set that as the initial goal for these regulations and these programs. The second question I have, uh, same section letter H, mastery sets uh, competency requirements at 80% or higher. Where was that number established and validated? Yes, yeah, so that number was established based on national norms around competency-based education. This is one of the key distinguishing factors for CBE is that students have to actually demonstrate mastery at a high level of performance. So that when they complete a particular competency or a particular program, you know that they didn't just work their way through content, but they actually mastered the content. So that 80% uh, was based on national norms for other competency-based education programs, which tended from 80% to much higher, but we thought 80% was a good uh, stake to put in the ground for our system. Thank you. Under the next section, 55260.2, um, this one is B4. Um, it's using the terms field and subfield for the first time in all of these regs, and I was wondering if that refers to discipline and subdiscipline? Yes, yes. You can think of that similarly as discipline and subdiscipline, yes. Is it necessary then to define field and subfield in this area? 
we will definitely take a look at that. Under the same section, this one happens to be, um, let's see, number 10. Uh, it uses the terms uh, student success support services. And further down, it has student success and support services. Is there a distinction between a student success support service, a student success service, and a support service? No, I would say there's probably more uh, nomenclature happening there. there there's no distinction. Um, it's really talking about that bucket of student success support services. Thank you very much. Further down, um, there's a section that mentions the summative assessments can be uh, attempted three times, but no greater than three times. And then further down, it says that the district should uh, establish what is the acceptable number of repeats for a summative assessment. Shouldn't it be consistent throughout so that if we set a number at three, the number should be at three and we direct the district to also address three as the repeatability? So that is a great question. We will, we will definitely take a look at that um, as we prepare for second read. Further down on 55260.8, academic record symbols and grade point average, there is a section that, uh, let's see, it's under E1, the competency-based transcript shall use the evaluative and non-evaluative symbols, and it references up above to A and B. B already mentions that they are non-evaluative symbols, but A does not reference the term evaluative symbol. Is it more appropriate to add in letter A, um, shall adhere to the following evaluative symbols? Uh, we will take a look at that as well. Thank you for this. And Member Grande, I might need to follow up with you afterwards to, to uh, make sure I capture each one of these. Very well. Um, then the last one that I'll mention is on 55260.11 academic calendar. I have always been of the persuasion that when you're defining a term, you try not to use a term. So here is the definition of non-term. A non-term is a term where modules overlap terms and do not commence or conclude within a term. Is there any way that we could avoid using the term term in the definition of non-term for term? That's another one we can look into, right? We'll take all this feedback and look into it. I do see your point. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I want to tell you, I so champion these changes. I cannot tell you how excited I am that we're having a first read on them. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're glad to have you on the board, Jelena. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very uh, uh, detailed uh, review of them. I believe uh, member Williams, did you have a? Yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you thought this would uh, impact students that are taking advantage of um, AB 705 or uh, workforce opportunity programs. Yeah, so uh, when we think about uh, what this does for our system and adding this in additional instructional model uh, we think it's going to be particularly important for workforce development, right? We're talking about creating programs uh, that are based in competencies toward the goal of employment. Uh, so that's one of the key distinguishing factors around a competency-based education program um, is that there are those expectations that there would be a, a scan of employment opportunities and that the program and the competencies would be designed in alignment with those opportunities. In terms of AB 705, um, I don't know if there's much of a direct impact there, right? AB 705 would certainly apply to this program as to any other program in terms of placements. Uh, but one other key distinguishing factor around uh, C, uh, CDE programs is there's much more of an individualized process around counseling within CBE programs, where uh, the expectation is that uh, there would be this one-on-one -on -one opportunity to really uh, counsel students before they join a CBE program around the program, its objectives, and ensuring that it's a good fit for them before they proceed. I guess I was just thinking about around their success. I know that there's some measures in here that students would have to um, achieve, and so I was just wondering if you, if you all had a beat on whether success for those students would go up, maybe it might wane down. And then, you know, another question came to mind is, do you have a bead on um, 
district's capacity to, to, to implement this? Like, are they going to need technical support or are districts versed in this, um, this, this methodology already and they can just kind of implement? Yeah, so to your first qu question, Member Williams, uh, we, that time will tell, right? So a big part of this effort is ensuring evaluation, all right, that we understand what the impact is and how it is benefiting students. Certainly, if we look at the national research, we would expect that this is uh, a lever for increasing completion uh, for our students as well as increasing employability because that's what we see nationally around competency-based education programs. Uh, towards your point of district capacity, uh, it is toward that point that we really are uh, starting off with this pilot. We're actually calling it a collaborative where we could work with a small uh, group of colleges and actually walk through the process of implementation together to understand in particular those areas where districts are going to have to do things differently. Faculty load looks very different under CBE. Uh, there might be implications for faculty contracts. The role of faculty looks different under CBE. They are both instructors as well as counselors. There's going to be impact uh, in terms of FTS and apportionment. So we want to work through all of those details with districts who are hungry and ready to take this on. We'll be having a webinar soon to introduce the concept of that collaborative and putting out an interest form to see how much interest there is. Um, it is my hope there will be tons of interest, uh, but we also are very cognizant of the realities of the situation that our colleges and districts are in right now um, in the midst of these multiple crises. But I'm quite sure uh, we can get, uh, you know, at least a subset of colleges that are ready uh, to implement these programs and help work together for creating a blueprint. I've already heard from at least a handful of college presidents in advance raising their hands and saying they're ready when we are. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board comments? Um, I have a question actually, um, just kind of a big picture question is, uh, how does this impact uh, on Calbright and in particular, how Calbright shares uh, what it learns with all the other colleges? Another great question, President Epstein. Um, in terms of the impact on Calbright, I'll be honest, I have not thought through what the, what the impact might be there. Uh, but it's certainly an opportunity for collaboration uh, with Calbright, uh, for collaboration on technology infrastructure to support competency-based education, um, and for collaboration for any ways that we might share best practices as we look to leverage competency-based education across our system. Chancellor Oakley, do you have anything to add on that? Of course. Uh, I'd say this, this presents a great opportunity for collaboration between Calbright and those colleges that raise their hand and, and want to begin the implementation. I think certainly uh, the infrastructure that Calbright has laid already with uh, the learning management system that it's implemented, Strut Learning, which is designed specifically for CBE, I think would, would create a great platform a great opportunity to begin to to work in that direction. I think um, my understanding is that Calbright is already in discussion with several colleges to, to help them through some of their uh, implementation and partnership opportunities. And again, um, I, I think this just continues to uh, highlight the need for all of our colleges to put a greater emphasis on adult learners. And I think this gives us an opportunity to, to look at the full spectrum of learner. Calbright is focused on uh, uh, some of the most under-resourced adult workers, uh, as some of uh, adult workers who have the least amount of education. And I think the work that uh, Dr. Lowe is doing uh, with the field allows us to begin to scaffold that to uh, higher levels of credentials and, and learning. So I think this will give us a great opportunity to look at the full spectrum of need that the state has and uh, uh, begin to really link the other colleges with Calbright much, much more um, uh, deliberately. Thank you. And I believe uh, Member Grande wants one last bite at this apple. Just, just a clarifying question. All of these regs are related to credit courses and credit-based instruction. And I was under the impression that Calbright is non-credit. How will this help Calbright, if at all? 
So Member Grande, you are correct. These are credit courses and these are four credit degree programs, right? Hence why my response to President Epstein was, um, you know, I don't know how this will help Calbright, but there's certainly an opportunity for Calbright to help the system um, in terms of collaborating um, on the infrastructure and the practices needed for us to scale CBE across our system. And just a quick reminder that when the legislature approved Calbright, it was for the purposes of, uh, of serving students who were trying to obtain um, competencies, uh, uh, work skills, and not the higher level degrees that this regulatory change would allow uh, the other 115 colleges to accomplish. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, the public hearing on item 5.4, the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations, Title V, sections 55260 through 55260.13 is now open. The purpose of the hearing is for the Board of Governors to receive comments and, and testimony from members of the public regarding the proposed regulatory action. At this time, the floor is open for comments from the public. So uh, we have a few verbal comments. Um, Eric Kalimagi, I will um, give you control of your microphone and you can address the board. Thank you, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, members of the board and Chancellor Oakley. I'm Eric Kalimagi. I'm the president of the California Community College Association, which is the CTA affiliate dealing with issues of higher education. Direct assessment competency-based education is actually a very old form of education used in the medieval ages and continued today with the training of apprentices. It is a common tool in how we train modern day electricians, engineers, and physicians. However, it is not currently the dominant form of education in the CCC system. In our system, multiple laws, regulations, and contractual agreements have been created that make standards or assumptions about faculty workload. And in two places, I've identified the proposed competency-based regulations conflict with these accepted workload measures. First is section 55260.3 on modality. The proposal notes that delivery must consist of fully or partially online modules. While a college may certainly choose to make these programs online, there does not appear to be any pedagogical reason why they must be so restricted. In fact, many vocational programs today use a form of direct assessment, competency-based education principles in an in-person environment. This matters because section 55260.5b notes that the preparation to teach in a distance education modality requires preparation as noted in section 55208. This means that if adopted as written, all direct assessment competency-based education faculty must also be distance education faculty. This is an additional training requirement and would reduce the number of adjunct faculty available, at least after the pandemic, uh, to teach in the affected programs. Second is section 55260.11A3 on the academic calendar. Board member Agrande mentioned this earlier, it's the non-term which is a term where the modules overlap terms and don't commence or conclude within a term, which essentially means almost anything you want it to be. We have many places in law and contract that define workload as units or some equivalent within a term. We have overload and intercessions similarly defined as work that's specifically inside or outside a term. We have laws that define whether a faculty member has completed a year of service, and contracts defining supplemental duties based on terms. Non-terms throw uniform faculty workload agreements into disarray and create the possibilities of both having a class where all students have passed, and so there's no instruction work, and conversely, a course where students remain once the faculty work assignment has ended. I encourage the elimination of sections 55260.3 and 55260.11A3 from the proposed regulation. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Dolores Davison. Uh, you have control of your mic. You can address the board. 
Good morning, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the Board of Governors. President Epstein, I am delighted to know that you now have a gavel. Uh, I am Dolores Davison. I'm president of the Academic Center for California Community Colleges. I would like to thank Vice Chancellor Lowe, um, General Counsel Mark LaForest, DA, members of 5C, and particularly Cheryl Aschenbach and Ginny May from the Academic Center for California Community Colleges, who have been working on this for quite some time. I am a especially appreciative of Vice Chancellor Lowe and General Counsel LaForest DA's willingness to sit with the members of the Academic Senate uh, for an hour and a half and go through these regulations line by line. And I am particularly appreciative of Board Member Grande's willingness to go through the same document line by line and point out some things that we may have missed so that we can go back and correct those. I do wanna point out that currently many of our colleges are doing a version of competency-based education uh, this will bring that into alignment with those colleges and give them some protections. Uh, we obviously do not touch on the union matters, but we are appreciative of uh, President Kalimagi bringing forward those issues to this board. And we look forward to continuing to work with Vice Chancellor Lowe and others in the Chancellor's Office uh, to continue to refine these regulations to the satisfaction of everyone involved. Thank you very much. We've received no written public comment for this item. Are there any additional members of the public who would like to speak on this matter? Hearing none, this public meeting hearing is closed. This concludes the public hearing on this matter. Okay, and that concludes uh, all the first readings. Um, we are now on uh, to item 5.5. .5. Uh, uh, about the nomination of officers. Um, under the board procedures, the nomination and election of board officers proceeds in two steps. The nomination process begins today, the next to last meeting in the calendar year. The election of board officers is conducted at the last regular meeting of the calendar year, which will be in November. Nominations for president and vice president are received when the president solicits them from members of the board. Additional nominations may be made in writing to the chancellor at any time prior to the election. Nominations do not require a second. The president and vice president who are elected will take office as the last order of business at the November meeting. They serve one year terms and may be elected for no more than two consecutive terms. In light of the board procedures allowing nominations up to the time of the election and to ensure a fair process for all nominees, I would like to suggest that all comments in support of a particular nominee be held until the November meeting, when we will be sure to allow time for discussion before we vote. Accordingly, I would like to request members of the board provide me any verbal nominations they wish to make at this time. Although I would like to take the president's privilege and uh, nominate Vice President Pamela Haynes to be president of the board. Thank you. Are there any nominate other nominations at this time for president of the board? Okay. Um, then, uh, are there any nominations for vice president of the board? Hey, Tom, I'd like Never to have. nominate Amy Costa for vice president. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice President um, Haynes. I would like to nominate Hildegard Aguinaldo for Vice President. Thank you. Are there any other nominations at this time? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would also note again that the additional nominations can be submitted to the Chancellor in writing. This concludes this item. Okay, um, now we're on to uh, board meeting dates for 2022. For those of you who are thinking ahead. Um, is, uh, who's presenting this item? Uh, I, Deputy Chancellor Gonzalez? Yeah. 
Yes, so this is a first reading item. Historically, the board has wanted to publicly share the dates. I am asking you to think about 2022. We also touched the calendar. We did compare it to any national holidays as well as state holidays. As you know, we also have to coordinate with many of the other segments, particularly with the arrival of our Lieutenant Governor. And uh, we also checked to see if there were any statewide conferences. Since this is 2022, there's not a lot of information out there, but since it is a first reading, you will get a chance to formally vote on these days at your November meeting. Thank you. Are there any uh, board comments on the calendar at this time? Are there any public comments? We received no public comments for this item. Okay. Well, that concludes um, our first reading agenda. And uh, so now we have item 6.2, the fiscal health process and the Peralta Community College District. As, uh, as Vice Chancellor Navarrete uh, gets ready to do her presentation, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that um, I know I personally, and I know board, the board has received many comments from members of the public in the Peralta Community College District expressing uh, concerns um, either uh, for a special trustee or against a special trustee. And I just want to uh, remind the public that uh, the board is not voting for or against a special trustee here. We are providing uh, continuous updates to the board with respect to the fiscal condition and the governance processes at the Peralta Community College District, which uh, we continue to monitor very closely. And I am personally in constant communication with the leadership of the board at the Peralta Community College District. I've also had the opportunity to speak with several members of the uh, elected uh, representatives uh, in and around the, the Peralta Community College District to keep them abreast. Uh, what we wanna do is lay out clarity around the expectations uh, for the continuity of instruction at the Peralta Community College District. And, and I would ask members of the public to, uh, while it, uh, we appreciate the comments uh, being sent forward, uh, it is critically important that those comments be received by the local college, uh, elected college board, which is where the uh, responsibility for the continuity of instruction lies and who we are going to be working closely with to support in any way we can to ensure that they continue to provide the services that the students of that district deserve. With that, I will turn it over to Vice Chancellor Neverett. Good afternoon, members of the board, um, and thank you, Chancellor Oakley, for framing this item. Um, the purpose of this item is really to present two key pieces. One is how we're refining our fiscal health and resiliency portfolio, and I'll introduce you to a framework called Fiscal Forward, and also to present you updates on the Peralta Community College District, our monitoring role, um, and again, as mentioned, how we will work with that community college district to preserve their accreditation and ensure there's continuity of, ed of education. Next slide, please. I want to begin by first framing uh, the board's responsibility and key role of the Board of Governors um, in both advancing the vision for success, but also around um, fiscal health and overall monitoring. Consistent with Education Code 84040, the Board of Governors uh, role is really to ensure the efficient and effective use of public funds for our um, community colleges and the support of our students. And the Board of Governors has the responsibility um, to intervene um, when there's a high probability that um, if unabated, the district would need an emergency appropriation. Next slide, please. We also uh, highlight that within Title V, we have principles of sound fiscal management, and um, that includes uh, both a review of accreditation as well as governance issues. And so the Chancellor's authority really is to provide assistance or intervention through multiple approaches, through technical assistance, through authorized reports or analysis by the Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team, known as FICMAT, 
and to the request for progress and improvement reports. Lastly, as you know, through the appointment of a fiscal monitor or a special trustee. Next slide, please. And so I want to talk to you about the fiscal health and resiliency work that we've been doing. This is a new approach to how we address um, the challenges that many of our districts are looking at that through a more um, proactive approach. Next slide, please. We want to look at the components of good fiscal health through the intersection of multiple areas. One, governance issues. The other is prudent fiscal health practices, accountability, but a component that is just as important is the equitable allocation of resources. And that's something that is um, integrated uh, in our work, but also the vision for success. Next slide, please. And so um, we've launched and are working to further develop uh, fiscal Forward, it's a new portfolio that recognizes the importance of, uh, again, the intersection of fiscal health, governance, and accreditation. The cornerstone of this strategy is really prevention through early engagement and technical assistance. Um, as we've seen come before you, we don't want to engage with the district just when they're already in trouble. We want to engage early, support their leaders, and support them in the short and long-term planning of um, their fiscal health. And so, well, the fiscal health components of Fiscal Forward are to engage with the new leaders of these campuses by uh, supporting the new executive officers and new chief business officers through training and technical assistance. Uh, there are a lot of intricacies when a new leader comes to a district and has responsibility to ensure the district is on the right track we want to help them in that step, give them the information they need, um, advise them as, as needed, or at least point them to the information that can help them set a district and address any red flags that may exist. We want to work with our partners um, at ACCJC to address any uh, accreditation issues that are connected with fiscal health. And then we also want to ensure that um, governance is addressed and that we are working with districts to understand both the short and long-term challenges um, of uh, uh, maintaining district solvency and supporting students. So those are the elements of Fiscal Forward. Next slide, please. Again, the cornerstone is really uh, a redesign of this work so that we start working with districts much earlier so that we destigmatize the continuous monitoring of fiscal health. So again, it doesn't happen when there's already an inclination that a district might be in trouble, but instead it becomes part and parcel of the work to continuously review and make updates um, that will ultimately serve the long-term health of that district. So that's um, our new portfolio of work. Next slide, I want to share um, what we've been doing um, in our work with Peralta Community College District, and I'll end by providing some considerations for the board. Next slide, please. So we have been working with Peralta Community College District. Uh, last year, you received an update to the board providing um, an analysis that had been done by um, FICMAT that pointed out some needs for corrective action and some targeted goals that were established for that district. Um, we also um, then engaged in steps to hear from the Peralta district. You heard from them in May. Um, and at, at the May meeting, you asked for um, a report on the role between uh, the board and the CEO and how they intersect their work um, and where there is a clear division of responsibilities um, to prevent micromanagement, especially. Now um, we're at the final step where you're looking at um, whether progress has been made, you're looking at corrective actions if necessary, um, and evaluating other ways that we can support, again, the continued progress of this district and the support of their students. Next slide, please. And so since, um, I'll, just a brief overview, uh, we've, um, on fiscal health, we continue to monitor 
their corrective action plan to address the deficiencies identified in the FICMAT study of 2019. Um, there has been some progress on them, but one of the key cornerstones of the fiscal health piece and challenges that many studies continue to find is the instability of their leadership. Um, we highlight that as an area that needs additional attention and concerns have further arisen with the district having uh, four district chancellors in two years um, and two of the four college presidents um, uh, being vacant um, or recent hires and six um, chief financial officers in four years. Next slide, please. We also, again, have looked at their governance. Um, and uh, again, this board requested that uh, the Peralta board submit a plan to Chancellor Oakley delineating the delegated authority of the board and the district chancellor, looking at three key areas, how it conducts its business, the articulation of responsibilities, and a professional development plan on how to implement again, a better relationship with their administrative staff and um, the district goals. A preliminary plan was submitted to us on August 14th and a final report is still pending. Lastly, on the next slide, I'll share that um, the, all four colleges are required to submit a special report to ACCJC by November 1st. Um, this is a result of being placed on probation. Um, and in that report, they will be addressing um, concerns by ACCJC, which have identified the lack of resolution on previous identified deficiencies. Next slide. Um, so finally, I'll, I present to you um, areas of consideration. Both, um, they're in two parts, um, considerations of actions for the Peralta board, the Peralta governing board, um, you'll see here essentially a list of key dates that we are asking them to meet. All of these dates follow a key theme. It's stabilizing their leadership so that they, as a district, can move forward and continue to make progress on their identified goals and their efforts to meet accreditation standards and continue to support stu students during these challenging times. Uh, cornerstones include um, appointing an interim chancellor, appointing a permanent chancellor, meeting ACCJC recommendations and submitting a report. And then uh, lastly, also submitting an uh, interim update to us by December 30th of this year so that we can uh, reevaluate whether any of these dates need to be adjusted. And the next slide um, I just mentioned um, these are considerations for all of you on the Board of Governors um, that um, to how you can continue to support this work. And it's really around ensuring that we at the Chancellor's Office continue to implement the fiscal forward portfolio of, of services and technical assistance. Again, that's early and engages quickly. Deploying a FICMAT technical assistance where needed, especially during leadership transitions, and we can do that for the new Peralta Community College Chancellor. And then requesting that this item be brought back um, at a later date, and if absent progress by the Peralta Board on the items presented to you on the prior slide, that the uh, Chancellor could be prepared to make a re recommendation about a special monitoring team or a special trustee. Uh, but again, we hope that consistent progress is made. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention to this important issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions. You're on mute, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, we're open for uh, board comments. Uh, Vice President Haynes. So th thank you so much for that report. Um, so I need um, some clarification about um, the oversight and the technical um, assistance that's being um, offered um, and received by Peralta. Um, and the, when we talk about ongoing, are, are there folks who are on the ground, what, on a daily basis or how, how is that, if you can share with 
what that looks like for Peralta, um, especially relative to the fiscal um, issues and then the ACCJC um, uh, uh, issues. Right. So one of the offerings that we've provided to the Peralta board is that once a, an interim chancellor is appointed, that we provide technical assistance through our partners at um, FICMAT, but also through the expertise that we have within our fiscal services team here, where we can analyze prior reports from that district, prior audits, and essentially walk that leader through um, some of the key steps that could be taken to make progress towards advancing and addressing um, their fiscal health challenges. Um, we also um, have been working and are currently waiting for a final set of board goals from goals from the Peralta Community College District Board uh, as to how they're also going to address some of these issues and can and intend to continue those conversations um, and encourage them towards making progress towards that. So that's our current work. We also um, would offer that same level of engagement to the new permanent chancellor that is appointed, walking them through, again, uh, a long history of um, reports, analysis, so that they go in fully understanding where the college has been, where it can go, and how they can address short and long-term needs. So it, I have a follow-up. I, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, ACCJC and uh, Community College League of California also are providing support to Peralta, and we are coordinating with both of those entities as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. My follow-up to that, um, do we know to what extent, we've, we've talked about sort of the, the, um, the top positions, uh, but we haven't talked about, are, are there any vacancies that are actually doing the daily work and have they been filled temporarily or is there no problem with that? And I'm really, um, I mean, I know there's, there's governance, governance issues um, that, we, that need to be addressed, but I'm focusing right now on, on the fiscal pieces of this and to what extent there is, there is enough um, staff below um, sort of the, the heads of departments fiscally to actually get the work done uh, or is there, is there some, some gaps that um, need to be um, addressed? Yeah, one of the things that we're, we again continue to highlight as needs that this board needs to address is supporting uh, the, uh, their administrative ramp up and, and hiring. Um, right now, their uh, chief business officer is serving as an acting, uh, as the acting chancellor. And so they're really serving in a, in a double uh, role. There are some other vacancies that we know that they're currently looking to hire. So this is a key theme and something that um, is why it's presented to you as a consideration of where we continue need, continually need to monitor this district that they may pro make progress. You need leaders on the ground to stabilize that district. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, Member Costa was next. Yeah, my questions were kind of similar to Vice President Haynes, but a little bit different of a tact, which is, you know, obviously the Chancellor's Office has the ability to provide technical assistance. One of the issues that has come up um, as Chancellor's staff has presented this is this governance issue between the board and or their lack of leadership. And I'm wondering specifically, I appreciate that part of the technical assistance package is for the new leaders as they come in, that's certainly needed. However, what if any technical assistance are we providing to the board? And many of these things are measurable. I don't have an answer to this. I don't know how we, how we measure that. <laughs> how do we measure kind of the relationship um, between the board and, and the leaders? I'm, I'm not sure there's a milestone for us there. So I'd be open to your comments or really anyone's on that. Yeah, so the Peralta Community College District Board is currently working with an esteemed leader, uh, Dr. Helen Benjamin. She is really working with them to help establish some of these goals and answer that key question of what is the responsibility of the board and what is the responsibility of the administrative leaders of that campus? And how do you embed that so it becomes part of the operating culture of that district? 
that's um, a long, a lot of work ahead that's still needed, but we're relieved that that work has begun, um, again, with a talented leader that is helping them make progress on that. Um, we are looking forward to the final progress report that we receive from them where they outline the, their next steps and actions. That's an important uh, milestone. Um, this board hasn't typically asked um, other local district boards to share uh, how they are working to address their governance issues. And it's an important step that, again, um, recognizes that there is an intersection between governance and fiscal health. If I can add to that as well, uh, Member Costa, two, two things. One is I am in direct uh, communication with Dr. Benjamin uh, about uh, the work that she's doing with the board. I, I also have um, uh, conversations with the board president um, to see how things are going. Um, ultimately, um, we know that there are several uh, boards throughout the state that you know, on any given day have conflicts with their administration or have conflicts that they're working through. So the issue isn't whether or not there's conflict in the governance process. The issue is, do they have the means and the mechanisms, the policies and the practices to work through them? Um, and so that's what we're focused on. We're not gonna be able to resolve uh, uh, personality conflicts um, at, at a district but we can expect that a board have in place uh, practices and policies that allow it to work through those issues in a way that um, supports uh, the, uh, the, the learning um, of, uh, of the students that they, that they serve. Um, the other issue that I want to make mention of is we are in constant um, uh, conversation about the searches that they are conducting. So first of all, uh, the search for uh, the interim. Um, we expect that that will conclude by October 1st and that uh, an interim will be named. It's very important for us uh, that a person be assigned the duties of the chancellor so that we can work with that individual. Second, we have um, uh, asked that the board conclude the search for the permanent uh, by um, uh, March of next year, 2021. Now that is a very aggressive timeline. Uh, and we recognize that we've laid out very aggressive timelines. Um, what I commit to the board is if progress continues to be made and then the board requires additional time on the back end of those timelines, we will come back to the Board of Governors and, and uh, ask that we extend those timelines, but we are going to hold tight to those timelines because I agree with board member Haynes that it's critical that people with the right skills be in place to ensure that the district uh, is, um, is in a position to meet all the accreditation requirements and all the fiscal health requirements. Other board member comments, questions? Well, I have a few. Uh, I, um, I, I am deeply concerned about some of the issues raised by the former interim chancellor, Stanback Stroud. Um, I'm deeply concerned about this uh, constant turnover of key positions, both the chancellor, the presidents of colleges and other key uh, staff like the uh, chief financial officer. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, allegations that um, that uh, the Brown Act is not being followed uh, by uh, by some members of the board and um, I think it's really important that we have uh, a very disciplined um, uh, approach to this uh, and it sounds like that's happening I think that's good uh, but, uh, but the, I, I in particular want to know if uh, if any of the uh, the allegations made by uh, Dr. Stanback Stroud have been resolved, and uh, and what you discovered. So, specifically to the allegation 
of discrimination or violations of the Brown Act. Um, those are issues that um, are specific to, to the district and would be handled by the district attorney uh, for that area. And that's, I know General Counsel Forstier has been um, uh, monitoring uh, the situation there uh, and making sure that those issues are referred to um, the, the local uh, district attorney. Um, we are certainly available to provide any information that, that, that we need. Um, but at this point, I'm not aware that any of them have been resolved, uh, but we continue to monitor that. And we will work with the interim chancellor to ensure that we're aware of any pending litigation um, that would affect um, uh, the governing board. Okay, thanks. Uh, hearing no other board uh, questions, uh, we can go to public comment, of which I understand there is quite a bit. Uh, so the first uh, verbal comment that we have, um, we also have an email comment from this uh, commenter um, do you want to go ahead with the verbal comment as well? Yes, the verbal comment, and, and we should delete the uh, written one. The written? Okay. No, go ahead with the verbal. Okay. Uh, Donald Moore, your, uh, you have control of your microphone. You can address the board. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome back, Mr. Moore. I'm glad you uh, hung in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been busy with everything. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, extend a, a thank you to uh, the state chancellor for uh, outlining in um, his, uh, 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 all of the different areas that he had discussed uh, in um, uh, the agenda uh, that was presented about a week or two ago, uh, and now with these comments. Yes, you know, we are, we as, a, as an organization, I'm representing the uh, district academic senates and the academic senates. Uh, we too want to see some stability at this uh, district. Uh, we have been working diligently with all of the different uh, folks here to create our five-year plan to address the ACCJC uh, issues, the FICMAN issues, and so forth. And we feel very strongly that we have moved diligently towards those. The unfortunate part to it, and, and it raises up an issue, has been the area around uh, executive uh, management turnover. And we are concerned about that as well. We want to have stability. So we look forward to having uh, our November uh, letter to the ACCJC accepted and us being removed from probation in their meeting in December, but we won't know that till after that time period. Uh, with regard to uh, the chancellor search, yes, the interim chancellor search we've participated in, and we hope to hear from the board of, uh, the board of trustees uh, before the uh, end of uh, this, <coughs> this month. <clears throat> I am a little bit concerned about the March date. One of the things we need with a, a interim is to provide stability for ideally the rest of this school year. I think that we might be able to uh, get through a uh, selection process and maybe have negotiated where that person comes in uh, during the summer or something. I think that would probably uh, be useful. We do need stability. We need to fill certain key positions. We need to see how our audits are. Uh, so far, all indications are that we're doing very well and we uh, more than likely will not have uh, audit findings. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that with the turnover of our board of trustees where there are going to be new members, our efforts internally to address these issues, uh, we really are concerned about local control of our board and like to uh, support main maintaining that. And we look forward to the kind of technical support that the uh, state chancellor can provide us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, other public comments? Yes. Uh, 
Debbie Klein, uh, you have control of your microphone. You can address the board. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the Board of Governors. This is Debbie Klein, President of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. FAC is happy to learn, as we just heard, that improvements have been made within the Peralta Community College District. We appreciate the Chancellor's Office's understanding that districts must maintain local control in order to effectively serve their students and communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Elani Gestis. You have control of your microphone and you can address the board. Yes, hello, good afternoon, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, members of the Board of Governors, Chancellor Oakley, and Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. My name is Eleni Gastis, and I'm the Faculty Senate President at Laney, Guided Pathways Co-Coordinator, Journalism Department Chair, and Advisor to Peralta's only student-run publication, The Citizen. The Laney Senate and the District Academic Senate have authored resolutions in opposition to the potential appointment of a special trustee at Peralta. I am a graduate of the college I serve and I am deeply committed to the vision for success. It is difficult to listen to allegations and hearsay about what is happening in our district and we urge the state chancellor's office to engage with faculty, classified professionals, and students who are on the ground to learn more about our reality at Peralta and any additional context needed to make assessments about what our issues are. We also urge you to question why three college presidents have left our district within the last nine months and when referencing executive turnover, we hope that you will have the full picture of the last year at our district. We believe Peralta is on track to continue to make improvements such as those evidenced by fiscal monitor Jim Austin at your May Board of Governors meeting. Our community is in the midst of a pandemic, quickly adapting to online learning and doing everything we can to serve students. We are concerned that the potential appointment of a special trustee and the local control it erases will have negative consequences on our students. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. President Epstein, I yes. just, I have received personally over uh, 151 comments regarding this item. And I am compiling the list of names and will provide that in the chat as soon as available. Uh, but I can read to you one of the comments I have received. Are they all identical or do they have different perspectives? I, most are very identical. Okay, please do. This one is from Matthew Goldstein. Dear Chancellor Oakley and Board of Governors, over the past 12 months, Peralta Community College District leadership has worked hard to overcome the remnants of fiscal management and has finally come to a point where their finances are in order. This was done through the collaboration of all stakeholders, trustees, administration, faculty, and staff. In addition, our request for a fiscal crisis management assistance team to assess and offer concrete areas for improvement, as well as your appointment of a fiscal monitor, has brought much needed stability to the district. We hope that the good work done at Peralta by our employees and the state chancellor's office can continue unabated without the appointment of a special trustee. Our concern is that the appointment of a special trustee to our district will only destabilize our district and undermine the hard work of our personnel and yours. As we contend with the emergencies and transformations to higher education that we are all adjusting to in our current moment, we ask that you allow our dramatically reshaped Board of Trustees, Administration, Faculty, and Staff an opportunity to build on the stability we have already achieved with the help of your office. And I just want to make a note that this is an informational item and that... Uh, President Epstein, sorry, this is Andrea Reynolds. I did want to just ask if it is okay, since we do have 151 letters received on this item that are all opposed with your permission, we would like to provide all the letters to the board and we can provide the letters to the public upon request. Uh, definitely. And you could also apply that principle to some of the other uh, items where we had to aggregate multiple comments. Thank you. 
So Christina, are there any others that are materially different from what you just read? No, sir. Okay, are there any other live public comments? Okay, um, I believe uh, member Anderson uh, would like to speak. Tom, my issues have been covered, thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other members of the board who uh, want to add anything at this point before we uh, close this item? Okay, uh, that'll do it. Thank you all for uh, all the all the folks who uh, who submitted comments. Uh, sorry we couldn't listen to them all live, but um, we will take it seriously and appreciate your engagement. So with that, uh, we'll move on to item 6.3, uh, contracts and grants approved by the board president. Thank you, President Epstein. We provided a detailed informational item. There was only one contract which, which was approved by board president Epstein related to Senate Bill 206, requiring the chancellor's office to create a working group to provide a report to the legislature. I'm happy to answer any questions. What I will say is staff needed to urgently move forward. There is a lot of interest in Sacramento to provide this report and it requires a lot of extensive work in the middle of a pandemic. So we appreciate the board president's support to move this work forward. Thank you. Are there any board comments on this item? Okay. Uh, Moving on to item 6.4, board member reports. Uh, for those of you who are new to the board, um, uh, near the end of every meeting, every board member is uh, provided an opportunity to speak briefly about um, whatever's on their mind, what they've done the last couple months. And uh, you're not obliged to, uh, to use that time, but you are welcome to. So um, with that, uh, we are open for board comments. Uh, member Fitzgerald. Well, if no one else has one, I'll go first. Um, I wanted to uh, start off by again uh, thanking you know the new members of the um, Board of Governors for for hanging in there for the first meeting and and extend my my sincerest gratitude. I'm I'm so looking forward to uh, developing a great working relationship with Member Williams and and of course um, with. Uh, member Tarasova and really fighting for the students in that perspective, um, as well as uh, the Lieutenant Governor. Um, in addition, I'm really happy about, uh, you know, the board's commitment to um, basic needs that we saw uh, last meeting, the board's commitment to DEI, to empowering students as a result of the diversity, equity, inclusion work. And um, just wanted to express again, my sincerest gratitude to my fellow members for their support in those initiatives. Um, to uh, you know, end it off, I hope that my fellow board members will continue to support um, the the uh, work that's coming. You know, uh, the the basic needs resolution and the DEI work. Um, while uh, there were some substantial actions taken at this meeting, it's just getting started. Uh, we have action that must come as a result of these discussions. And I hope that we'll continue to be supportive and, and, and you know, have your support in that action, um, including uh, the discussions that will come up uh, surrounding the uh, possible Title V changes to um, you know, clarify um, the, the students serving on hiring committees not being illegal and um, the work that will come as a result of that basic needs resolution, uh, the task force, whatever it be, um, really looking forward to your continued support. Uh, so again, my sincerest thanks and uh, looking forward to uh, working with the new members on these. Thank you. Uh, Member Williams. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment. First, I just wanted to thank the, uh, the chancellor and his team for the onboarding, um, both um, President uh, Epstein and Vice President Haynes for uh, the time that you spent with me and just helping me get up to speed on the, the range of issues that we cover. 
and just everyone who's made themselves available to to uh, me. And um, briefly, you know, I'm a former uh, community uh, student. I'm an alumnus of uh, San Bernardino Valley College and Crafton Hills College. Uh, former student trustee, and um, I was elected to the San Bernardino Community College Board uh, in 2013. First appointed, and then um, I'm serving in my second term. Um, I've served as a member of the California Workforce Development Board, the uh, California Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, and serve in a range of uh, local roles. Um, I work for an investor-owned utility, Southern California Edison. I work in philanthropy and community engagement. And um, I'm excited about the, uh, the opportunity to serve with you all, to bring a perspective from um, the Inland Empire on the board. Um, and also as an African-American male who has participated in the system. Um, I have a master's degree from Claremont Lincoln University in uh, social impact and a bachelor's from the University of Redlands in business. And um, just, you know, really excited about being able to add value to you all as a team member, learn more about what you all are interested in and really contribute to uh, making our system better for students. So. Um, looking forward to the day that we all can be face to face and, um, you know, just happy to be a member of the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're delighted that you're, uh, you're with us. Anyone else? Uh, member Anderson. Thank you. Uh, because member uh, Hall isn't here. I want to remind everybody today was supposed to or this week was supposed to be the week that I hosted the event for all of you. Uh, I, I just want to tell you, I'm very disappointed that we don't get to do that. I've had several texts uh, about my backdrops today. Um, this is the location I was going to do the event. So I can't wait till we can all get together and bring us all into one place. We can socially distance and be safe. Um, so I miss you all and I'm looking forward to when we can get back together. Thank you, us too. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Thank you. Um, well, let me just say it's uh, really an honor to be here with all of you uh, for my second day of my first meeting of the BOG, but I guess you call it the BOG. Is that what I understand? Okay. Um, I missed some of yesterday because for this month, there was a conflict with uh, my duties as a representative, as a trustee of the CSU. And I know um, your staff and thank you are going to try to work it out so that they don't conflict. Uh, I have the privilege of serving with Eloy on the board of trustees of the UC uh, and have had a chance to get to know him. And, and we really have uh, uh, been able to work together on some very substantive issues over at the UC. And, and I will tell you, I, I know you all know this, but this organization simply could not be led by a more capable and extraordinary person than Eloy. And of course, Tom and I have known each other for a long time as well. Very often I talk about higher education in California and people are often surprised to hear that there are 3 million students currently enrolled in public higher education in the state of California and that 2.1 million of them are enrolled in a community college. Uh, the percentages of students enrolled at the CSU and the UC um, of, of students who are enrolled there now but who started out at a community college in California are enormous and growing all the time as well. So the connectivity between these three systems uh, is something that was evident to me as very important um, from my very first days of serving on the board of the CSU and the UC and with consultations uh, with Eloy and with the governor, proposed that essentially the lieutenant governor's office in serving in this position would be able to um, provide a unique perspective as the only uh, elected official uh, to serve on all three. And uh, so I just cannot tell you uh, how, how honored I was that the legislature and the governor and Eloy all supported this idea. Uh, and that uh, the bill was signed just a few days ago, allowing me to be here with all of you. So um, I, people are always surprised how often I show up, uh, but uh, I am endlessly interested in the work of these institutions. And I will be quite uh, honest that I tell you that I find them endlessly complex 
uh, institutions that require uh, quite a bit of vigilance by the oversight boards to make sure that as times change, as students' needs change, as, as our staff's needs change, that we are there uh, ready to, um, to provide uh, you know, the kind of leadership that uh, is so necessary in this system of public higher education that has meant so much uh, to so many Californians. And I'll just say, because Darius and I have been friends for a very long time, and he knows my, my father, but my father started out in California as a farm worker and uh, ended up enrolling at Sacramento State and getting an education. He didn't quite graduate. I was the first in my family to go to a four-year university and graduate. Uh, but it's remarkable because my grandmother never learned to read, never learned to write. Her son was able to benefit from public higher ed in California. And I was able to go on and be a US ambassador and now lieutenant governor. Also, by the way, a beneficiary of public higher education is a UC Berkeley grad. Um, so that's a little about me. I really invite anyone who has perspectives that you might want to share with me offline uh, to let me know. I'm, again, pretty accessible and really very, very excited to be part of, of this board as the first but not last Lieutenant Governor of California to serve as a member ex officio of the Community College of California Board of Governors. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, we're so delighted to have you on with given your incredible background. And also you can help us on one of our top priorities, which is making sure our students can transfer successfully to both the CSU and the UC where you are uniquely positioned. So uh, that's really great. Uh, uh, Julia, uh, member Tarasova. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment and appreciate, give appreciation to everybody who I was able to meet, including the chancellor staff and introductions that have been given. I'm really looking forward to uh, a successful term, hopefully, of mine. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my goals. My goal as an effective uh, student advocate is to create an environment which promotes equity and acceptance to enrich students' experience through new ways of inclusion, communication, engagement. I'm really focused on student needs, issues, and stories. So I do have the patience and understand the importance of being heard in order to make a meaningful change as I am myself an ESL and first generation student. I joined student government because I had a desire to serve my community and directly contribute to the events and extracurricular curricular activities that gave so much meaning to college experience. And then I realized that it is so much more than that. And in each of the positions that I've held, I've learned a lot about students' issues and campus and how much, how to identify and resolve the problems that arise within. So today, as we do our best to navigate the new reality, I'm sure it will lead to new issues arising that will require the board's attention and action. However, one thing that will remain a constant focus for me throughout my term is communication and inclusion of student voices. Great, thank you. Other board member reports? Remember it. Board President Epstein, this is Member Escobar Carrillo. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to um, uh, I also extend my welcome to Joseph Julia and the Lieutenant Governor um, as, as new members of the board. Um, I, I, this is my year anniversary of, of board member meetings. Uh, my first board member meeting was in Riverside and I was also looking forward to going to Napa uh, to um, visit with Darius, but also to, you know, um, learn more about the community college um, there. And I'm so glad we were able to hear um, from uh, uh, from their leadership today uh, and to learn more about what they're, they're up to. Um, I also want to uh, extend my, my gratitude to Eloy and his team that helped um, particularly um, David O'Brien and um, also to the governor's team um, in the appointments process who helped Alma and I both and I, I think also you as well, uh, uh, board, uh, board President Epstein, get through the confirmation process um, just a few, uh, few weeks ago. Um, uh, it was, um, you know, difficult to obviously do this in the time of COVID, um, but uh, really appreciate the coordination and the support that they provided as we as we walk through the the confirmation uh, process. Um, you know, I 
uh, when I uh, chose to, to take on this role uh, and you know was given the opportunity, I was really excited. Um, I also had a kind of a life changing experience happen a couple weeks later when I found out I was pregnant. Uh, so it's also been uh, difficult to you know kind of continue to get uh, as involved as I can be in the board as I'm uh, as I was pregnant and now and just kind of back from maternity leave. But I look forward to this year um, being able to get uh, more engaged. I've had some great visits recently with um, AS ACCC President uh, Dolores Davidson and I've also visited recently with the Campaign for College Opportunity and I look forward to you know throughout the next few months uh, getting to know some of the other important institutions that help us um, really do our business um, the, the, the league and others um, as, as I'm learning more and more about the system it is as the lieutenant governor mentioned an incredibly complex um, uh, system, uh, but um, really important and value and bring so much value to the to our to our state and to our to our communities. Um, I'm also looking forward to joining um, Eloy and the team in some of the listening tours. Uh, you know, we had we had slated uh, to go to um, a Bakersfield um, right before uh, my baby came, actually in April, uh, and I was excited that I was actually still going to be able to go there on that trip because it was driving distance. Uh, and then obviously um, we've all been, you know, had to cancel many things um, due to COVID-19, but I'm excited that we'll have um, Bakersfield on the listening tour agenda vir virtually and looking forward to joining um, that and some of the other uh, events, um, tours that you, uh, that you have been planning with your team, Eloy. And then I also want to just say that I'm also looking forward to Undocumented Student Awareness Week. Um, when that item was brought up yesterday, I wanted to I wanted to say something, but also wanted to keep the agenda moving. Um, uh, excited to see all the the events that have been planned for the week and have a number of them um, on my um, on my calendar already. And uh, I would say if there's any way I could be helpful uh, in those uh, planning of those activities, please do let me know. DACA is something that is very uh, close to my heart. Um, the Dream Act, many. Um, of the uh, you know issues at the federal level with respect that relate to the undocumented student population or things that I've been working on my entire career. So I'd be happy to um, lend a hand, but um, just want to also support them in any way I can. So thanks so much. Thank you, and thank you for all your contributions in the in your first year. Any other uh, member Perry? Um, I want to welcome the new members as well and let you know that President Epstein was just kidding when he said he likes brevity in these statements. They should be <laughs> long, drawn out. You should go into your childhood, your aspirations, your dreams. The longer, the better. Nothing would make him happier. Um, uh, what I really wanted to say was that uh, we recently did a, a clothing event for uh, youth who have aged out of foster care. And at that event was a young man named Ernesto who had... Uh, emailed us and said very matter-of-factly, you know, I was at a community college and when I stopped living in my car, I transferred to a Cal State and it was just that very sort of matter-of-fact statement, living in my car, I transferred. And anyway, he came to the event. He could not be a better example or spokesperson for what we're doing. Um, the fact that he started the community college, um, he made the, the segue to a four-year his enthusiasm, his commitment, and you know the, the clear marker that the community college made in his life and has enabled him to transfer to the four year, and that he did it all um, clearly suffering from tremendous hardships. Uh, he just sort of spoke to, to what we do. So it was a, it was a pretty wonderful moment for me and uh, I wanna share with you all and reminded me of the really important work that we all do together. So thanks to all of you and, uh, and let's keep doing it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, we have one last item, which is the public forum, uh, which allows anybody uh, from the public to talk about anything they think we ought to hear. And uh, I understand we do have some comments, is that correct? Yes, I've received some written public comment. I can read those now. Are there any verbal comments? Uh, yes, uh, I was about to say not at this time, but now there is. Um, <laughs> uh, Larry Galizio, uh, you have control of your mic. Uh, you can address the board. 
Well, thank you very much, President Epstein, Vice President Haynes, Chancellor Oakley, members of the board, Larry Glesio, Community College League of California. And uh, on behalf of League and Trustee Board President Adrian Gray, uh, CEO Board President um, Pam Luster, and all everyone at the staff at the League, I wanted to give uh, uh, thanks for your public service and um, look forward to working with uh, you, member and, and uh, board trustee Williams, also member Tarasova, and also wanted to uh, thank Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis for being at our ledge conference last, uh, last January when we could all see each other face to face and look, the legal very much looks forward to working with you, Lieutenant Governor, and everyone. Uh, you know, the Peralta situation is extraordinarily difficult for everybody, especially the students, the community, and everyone that works there and all the stakeholders. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Chancellor's Office for all the work they're doing, people like uh, um, uh, our former colleague, Dr. Helen Benjamin, and the League is, is there to do whatever we can to help. I did just want to say that we have over 440 board members locally elected, and we have challenges, certainly. These are very difficult jobs. Uh, I just want to make sure that when we think about the 73 districts, we are reminded that we have trustees and boards that, that work quite well. The work is very difficult. It's very challenging, especially now. Um, but I just want to keep uh, the perspective that uh, we have um, very functional, effective, and strong board members who are continuing to do uh, professional development and do wonderful work. But again, whatever we can do to help with Peralta, I thank all of you for, for your patience and your public service and look forward to continuing this important work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, comments verbally? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, Christina, you have some uh, written comments? I do. Uh, I will read two for you. The first is from Danita Scott, Director with Student Support Services at San Joaquin Delta College. Good afternoon, President Epstein, Chancellor Oakley, and board members. I am Danita Scott, President of, Cal of the California Community College's Extended Opportunity Programs and Services Association. I greet you in memory of Senator Alfred Alquist, who authored SB 164, establishing EOPS in the California Community College system. On behalf of the nearly 100,000 students we serve, I thank Governor Newsom and the Chancellor's Office for its ongoing support and for reaffirming the importance of equity and success for programs like EOPS Care Next Up. As you grapple with the overwhelming impact of COVID-19 on our educational system, it is my reverent hope that EOPS Care Next Up remain priorities in your vision for success. As you know, students served by our programs are among the most marginalized communities. Our ability to provide intrusive counseling, retention, and over and above support services not only aligns with the Guided Pathways Initiative, but is critical to our institution's abilities to leverage the student-centered funding formula. We are an integral partner in helping students, our campuses, and our system meet the call for equity and student success. We look forward to continuing the work that began more than 50 years ago and remain committed to our collective mission and the success of our most marginalized students. Finally, while CCC EOPSA does not oppose the expanded emergency authority proposal, we do seek to ensure that the granting of such authority it continues to include consultation and constituency vetting. Thank you. The second one I will read is from Pastor Samuel J. Casey, Executive Director with Congressional Organized for Prophetic Encouragement, COPE. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Samuel Casey, and I am the Executive Director of Congressions Organized for Prophetic Engagement, also known as COPE. We are a Black-led, faith-based organization based in the Inland Empire. 
Through leadership, training, community, organizing, and programming, our core mission is to develop the capacity of religious and local leaders to protect and revitalize the communities where we live, learn, work, and worship. Revitalizing communities means reclaiming nearly $12 billion for schools and critical local services. We celebrate the members of the Board of Governors for supporting Proposition 15 and joining the fight to end an unfair tax loophole that has denied our schools and communities what they need for too long. Through our collective power, we can ensure that our students have what they need to thrive. Thank you. That's it? Mm -hmm. Okay, unless anyone has any uh, final remarks they wanna make, uh, we can adjourn. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us. This concludes the meeting of the Board of Governors.